you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, that the following students be appointed as pages for this, the first session of the 67th General Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island. Emmeline Stanley, Bluefield High School. Gabrielle McLean, Charlottetown Rural High School. Evelyn Peacock, Colonel Gray High School. Riley Lewis, Ecole Francois Biot. Kenneth Liang, Grace Christian School. Gage Creed, Montague Regional High School. Ava Trowbridge, Morell Regional High School. Campbell McNeil, Three Oaks Senior High School. Charlotte Carey. Carey. The Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, the following resolution of sympathy. Whereas the Honorable Marion Reed, former member of this Legislative Assembly for First Queens from 1979 to 1989, passed away on June 22, 2023. And whereas the Honorable Marion Reed served as the first woman speaker of this house from 1983 until 1986 and became the first woman to be Lieutenant Governor of our province in 1990. And whereas in 1993, women held five of the most influential positions of government in the province and were called PEI's famous five, and the Honorable Marion Reed held the position of Lieutenant Governor in this group. Therefore, be it resolved that this house recognize the contributions made by the late member, the Honorable Marion Reed, to this province. <clears throat> the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, Honorable Marion Reed was, uh, as. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Premier. Honorable Premier. Sorry. Yeah, not to preempt the wonderful <laughs> uh, comments that I know my colleague, the Leader of the Opposition, and others will make, but. Uh, uh, the Honorable Marion L. Reed was, uh, of course, an incredible force on Prince Edward Island, was an inspiring leader who broke many barriers and faced everything she did head on uh, and with passion. As the first woman to be the Lieutenant Governor of PEI, Marion, uh, as I say, was a pioneer and trailblazer, paving the way for many leaders to follow. She made wonderful contributions to the education of Islanders and was respected by everyone, and I mean everyone, Madam Speaker, who met her. Uh, later in political life, as I said, she served as the first woman uh, to be deputy speaker uh, and was the first woman to be speaker of, uh, in Prince Edward Island. Marion was a teacher for 21 years, served with the PEI Teachers Federation for seven years, uh, and as I say, her passion for serving Islanders uh, was easily exemplified through her extensive work for community and province. She received the Order of Prince Edward Island and the Order of Canada boats, which were very well uh, deserved. Uh, I knew Marion later in life uh, as a wonderful storyteller. I shared the stage with her a number of different times, and the first time was at the Watermark Theatre in beautiful North Rustico. I was, as, like many in attendance were, I was spellbound by her, her, her impeccable comedic timing, uh, her wonderful memory, uh, her recall, and her ability to connect with people, which I think served her very well in life, in politics, as an educator, uh, and, and many of the... Of the uh, positions that she served in in this province. She was, she was a wonderful gift to PEI. She lived a wonderful, amazing life, and it was my honor to represent Islanders uh, at her uh, official funeral uh, in the beautiful St. Anne's Church in her own backyard near Hope River. Uh, Marion went far and wide, but she never left the roots of Hope River, which was so important to her, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, we lost a wonderful, wonderful Islander, a wonderful person to all of her family who carry on her wonderful tradition. I offer my condolences and really my thanks to them for a life well lived and a life well served for Islanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the Premier for uh, bringing this resolution forward. Um, if I had one sentence to describe Marion Reed, it would be the passing of her Honorable Marion Reed, a dedicated trailblazer in politics and education, leaves behind a legacy of love, family values, and enduring commitment to the betterment of her community and to our island. And Madam Speaker, in her own words, and I quote, you have to have a little bit of common sense when you're in politics. No one to shut your mouth and no one to talk. And above all, be kind to people if they have, they have an opinion too. You're not going to start arguing with them. Say, I can see where you are 
coming from instead, end of quote. Um, as mentioned, she was part of the PEI Famous Five. Um, she was the Lieutenant Governor. Every day we were reminded of all the great work that she did in the past and being part of that Famous Five with her picture hanging here in the, in the gallery. Um, it was mentioned that she was a recipient of the Order of Prince Edward Island, the Order of Canada. She was also the Dame of Grace in, in the Order of the Hospital of St. Uh, John of Jerusalem. She had a degree of Doctor of Laws in 1997 and an honorary degree from Mount St. Vincent in 2022. Um, so my condolences to her family and I too want to thank her and her family uh, for all that she has done to make uh, this island a better place. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Marion led an exceptional life of service and being the first woman, as mentioned, to hold the position of Speaker in the PEI Legislature and Lieutenant Governor of PEI and, of course, part of the Famous Five. And I've had a few conversations with people who are in here and say, what a difference having that photo in here makes. It really does, kind of, does um, draw your eye and uh, help, help it to be more, a more inclusive space. Mrs. Reed received honorary degrees from UPEI and Mount St. Vincent, and among her many interests were the Lucy Baum Montgomery Land Trust, the Sterling Women's Institute, the Status of Women, and she served on the Action Committee of Family Violence Prevention. According to her family, her greatest loves were caring for her family and being a teacher, a value that was fostered by the tradition of hosting family dinners every Sunday until her 80th year at her home in Hope River. Her family continues this tradition every Sunday. Marion was predeceased by her husband, Lee, and uh, my sympathy to her children, her grandchildren, and her family. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Rustic Emerald. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I do want to, uh, to rise and give condolences to the, the family of Marion Reed and just recognize the outstanding contributions she's made to this province. And um, I'm going to do a member's statement tomorrow, Madam Speaker, Well, I'll go into uh, more more detail, but uh, I think her lasting legacy is ever present in District 18, Rustic Emerald, around Hope River, and I, I see that all the time when I'm out talking to people and I hear about her. Uh, in particular, uh, this this summer, the Sterling Women's Institute had their 110th anniversary, and she was honored there. And it, it was made crystal clear that the lasting impact she's made on, on the area. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable <coughs> Member for Charlottetown Belvedere. I also rise today to welcome Lloyd and Marlene um, Bryanton, great constituents of District 11, um, into the gallery today. Thanks for coming. The Honourable Member from Surrey, Elmira. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker, and uh, good afternoon to everyone watching from beautiful District 1. Welcome back. This is just for condolences. My apologies. Okay. We'll move on. <clears throat> We'll come back to you. <laughs> uh, the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I move, seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the following resolution of sympathy. Whereas the Honourable James Jim Lee, former member of the Legislative Assembly for Fifth Queens from 1975 to 1986, and Premier of this province from 1981 until 1986, passed away on October the 10th, 2023. Therefore, be it resolved that this House recognize the contributions made by the late member, the Honourable James Lee, uh, to this province. And Madam Speaker, I would just like to begin by extending my condolences to the family of, uh, of Jim. Uh, Jim was the 26th Premier of PEI, uh, and uh, Jim is someone who I came very close to, particularly in the last four and a half years of my life uh, in this position. and. Uh, I think I'm very proud to call uh, to Jim my friend, uh, and I'm, I recognize his son Jason is here as well today in the gallery and is a good friend of mine and has been for now on to 20 years, Madam Speaker. Uh, as I say, Jim served as Premier PEI from 1981 to 1986 and had many lasting impacts on Prince Edward Island. Uh, he entered politics in 1975, had his fair share of cabinet portfolios before becoming the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party in 1981 and succeeding uh, the late J. Angus McLean as Premier, uh, taking the party into an election in 1982 and winning uh, that election. Uh, during his leadership, uh, he oversaw the build of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital right here in Charlottetown, 
and was the leading force behind bringing all Atlantic provinces together to build the Atlantic Veterinary College at UPEI, which continues to be a shining example of Atlantic collaboration. I think during Jim's time as Premier, he represented Prince Edward Island at the First Minister's table during some very interesting times, I would have to say, in particular the negotiations of the uh, Constitution debate and the creation of the establishment, or sorry, of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, I know that was a very volatile time in Canadian politics, which seems every time seems to be volatile time in Canadian politics, but Jim had a catbird seat to some of the most definitive uh, pieces of legislation and changes that this country has seen. Uh, uh, and he did so in his, in his own way. He was, he was humble. He was people-oriented. He cared about PEI. He made time for people. He stopped and he talked and he listened. Uh, I would bring him into my office from occasion during my time in this position. And what I always admired about Jim was that he had opinions and he had things he wanted to share, but he would only do so if he was asked to do so. He never came in and said, young fella, this is what you should do and this is how you do it. He was very gracious, he was very kind, uh, and he was very wise. And uh, uh, I'm sorry to have lost Jim. I know he's lived a, a full life. He's very proud of his kids and his grandkids, and his eyes would light up when you talked about his grandkids. Uh, and uh, I'll miss him dearly. I have a photo of uh, Jim and all of the premiers who were living at the time in my office. I look at it every day. And uh, there's a big hole there now that Jim is there, but I know he's somewhere passing on good advice <laughs> and looking down on everybody here. And be no secret, he's wishing the Tories well during this session <laughs> of the legislature. <laughs> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and again, thank you to the Premier for bringing this resolution of sympathy uh, forward. Uh, the Honourable James Lee is a true representative of a dedicated Prince Edward Island patriot. His passing will be mourned deeply by his family and by the community in Ireland who were profoundly touched by his remarkable legacy of public service, leadership, and unwavering commitment to the betterment of this beloved island. He served as Minister of Tourism, Parks and Conservation in 1979 to 1980 and Minister of Health and Social Services, 1980 to 81. Um, he was the Premier from 1981 to 1986. At the tail end of that, given away my age, he was a Premier while I was uh, in high school. Um, and um, he married Patricia Laurie in, in 1960. At, sadly, she passed away in October of 2018. They have three children, Lorianne McGuinness, Patty Sue Lee, and Jason Lee, who's with us today in the um, gallery. Um, a major accomplishment that was mentioned was QEH, but, but his government, and that he was successful in the negotiation with the feds, was to obtain the uh, establishment of the School of Veterinary Medicine here on, on Prince Edward Island, and it is uh, an establishment to be well proud of uh, to this day. Um, he was appointed to be a commissioner of the Canadian Pension Commission, and in 19... 80, no, sorry, 1998, became the chair of the PI Workers' Compensation Board. So my condolences and sympathies uh, to his family, and I want to thank you for sharing him with all Islanders. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the Honourable James Lee, former Premier, is a man of many accomplishments and service to his community. He was first and foremost a family man, along with being a respected businessman, parliamentarian, premier of PEI, of course, and a leader in the community, and served as MLA for 11 years, representing Fifth Queens, and al already mentioned being a having a ministerial position uh, with tourism parks and conservation, as well as health and social services under J. Angus McLean. Um, and among many of his accomplishments, I know the, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital was mentioned and also the establishment of the Atlantic Vet College at UPEI during his time. He was PEI signatory on the Canadian Constitution during its repatriation in 1982 and closer to home in Stanhope was the chair of the North Shore Community Council. He was a devoted husband and proud father. Uh, he, as mentioned, was predeceased by his wife, Patsy, and my condolences to his children, Jason, who is in the, the gallery with us today, his grandchildren, and his great-granddaughter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like to rise to, um, Jim was a constituent of mine, and, and um, it, it Everybody knows that there's those people that you go see that you have 
to so develop a bond. It doesn't matter about politics. It doesn't matter. It was his. It was the way he listened with his eyes, and it was the way that I, I when I left there, I felt I felt that somebody cared about democracy. Somebody cared about what you were doing, and the kindness and the 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 respect he had for that is something that every premier should should follow. And he did such a remarkable job. So I just wanted to say, what an outstanding man, and the memories that are that are there, my time with them, I, I will always remember. So my condolences to you, Jason, and the family. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you. Honourable members, um, if we could so move the motion of uh, sympathy for Marion Reed. So moved. So carried. So carried. And uh, the motion for a resolution of sympathy for uh, the Honourable James Lee. So carried. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the following resolution of sympathy, whereas Walter McEwen, former member of the Legislative Assembly for Fifth Prince from 1989 to 1986, passed away on July 29, 2023. Therefore, be it resolved that this House recognize the contributions made by the late member, Mr. Walter McEwen, to this province. And Madam Speaker, uh, Walter McEwen, uh, who knew, anyone who knew Walter knew what a passionate person he was, uh, uh, many hobbies and interests after politics, and um, Walter McEwen was part of government when I really started to pay attention to what was going on in this province, and I can't help but think, as, as I was trying to think about his time in this legislature, some of the t things that he would have been dealing with as a member of cabinet and a member of government in that time, uh, the Confederation Bridge debate, uh, uh, making a fixed link to the, uh, to the mainland would have been such a volatile uh, issue for inside of this legislature at the time. Uh, also, at that time, there were many Canadian unity debates taking place, be they the Meech Lake Accord and then following the Charlottetown Accord and Walter, uh, like many of uh, the MLAs and cabinet ministers from that time, would have had a catbird seat to a credible part of Canadian history during that time. Uh, he was the MLA for fifth, uh, what we call Fifth Prince. Uh, he was elected in 1989. He was given a position in the Joe Giz government. Uh, he served in many, many capacities uh, in, in, that, uh, in that government. Uh, was just uh, an com incredible community builder someone who was very well thought of within his community and who served the province well, uh, made friends everywhere he went. After he finished uh, his career in politics, he continued his practice of law and really leaned into his volunteer work in his community uh, in Summerside and beyond. He was an avid leader and a vital member of many organizations. And I would say uh, Walter McEwen lived a life of commitment and public service. Uh, and I would like to extend my sympathies to uh, the family of Walter to all those who served with him in the legislature and to his family uh, for a, a, a very, very distinguished career and a life well lived. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Madam Speaker, and again, I want to thank the Premier for bringing this resolution of sympathy forward um, for Walter Chuck McEwen, who, who I may say is a, a, was a Liberal. Yes. A Liberal. And so he passed away, uh, as the Premier had mentioned, on July 29th, 2023, at the age of 83, and he did represent Fifth Prince. Um, Walter was a dedicated public servant uh, throughout his life, serving not only Islanders but all Canadians as well. He leaves behind a legacy of warmth, wit, and a profound commitment to this island. Um, before becoming an MLA for Fifth Prince, he was named to the Queen's Council in 1986. Um, after being elected, he served as Minister of Health and Social Services, Provincial Affairs, and as the Attorney General. After politics, he returned to practicing law, where he also served as a member of the National Parole Board of Canada. He was a great community supporter, and he was well-respected on a wide. My condolences and sympathies to his family. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Premier for bringing forward this, uh, this resolution. Uh, Walter was born and grew up in Montague. Uh, after receiving a law degree from Dalhousie, worked for a brief time in Toronto before returning to PEI with his young family, where he practiced law with Campbell McEwen, Taylor McClellan Law Firm in Summerside. 
Um, he was always interested in politics, and I won't mention, I won't go through the list of, of titles he held again, because we did hear that, and it's, it's an impressive list. And uh, after he retired from politics, he returned to the practice of law and served as a member of the National Parole Board of Canada. And in addition to his long uh, professional career, Walter could be found volunteering in the community or fly fishing here in PEI or in the Miramichi. And as mentioned, he is survived by his wife, Myrna, his sons, Scott, Sean, and James, and five grandchildren. And uh, my deepest condolences to his family and friends. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Shall the motion carry? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the following resolution of sympathy, whereas Eric Hamill, the former member of the Legislative Assembly for District 19, Borden Kinkora, from 1996 to 2003, passed away on September the 28th, 2023. Therefore, be it resolved that this House recognize the contributions made by the late member, Mr. Eric Hamill, to this province. And Madam Speaker, Eric Hamill was part of the Pat Binns government, and uh, I came to work uh, with that government, I got to know Eric very, very well. Uh, he was elected in 1996. He, uh, he was the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, and he made incredible, incredible contributions uh, to the agriculture industry in PEI. Uh, you know, a, certainly a champion of agriculture, if there ever was one. Uh, his lifetime leadership was recognized in 2000 when he was inducted into the Atlantic Agricultural Hall of Fame. Uh, and he had a true passion for Islanders that went beyond farming. He cared deeply about community. Uh, he did care deeply about people uh, and often would tell us that uh, the voices of everyone matter and it's not always the loudest people we should pay attention to, uh, that sometimes the people who speak the softest are the ones we should be leaning in and listening to the most. And that was kind of Eric's way and he did that. He did that very, very well. I'm reminded when I think of Eric uh, of sitting around the caucus table on the outside of it, and Eric Hamill, and of course the late Wilbur McDonald, who, Madam Speaker, you would know very well, whatever piece of work they were talking about at the table, one or both of them would always stand up and say, what is this going to do for farmers? <laughs> and when we were going through all of the challenges around the potato wart situation, which we were doing for recently, uh, you know, I thought of Eric and I thought of Wilbur often, uh, and uh, everything we were trying to do was in the spirit of trying to help farmers and trying to help PEI in general. Uh, and, and I thought that uh, on most days as we worked through those files that uh, Eric and others would be proud uh, that agriculture and farming was at the top of everyone's agenda and was so prominent in our day-to-day -day lives. So uh, he'll be missed. Uh, I want to send my uh, sympathies out to his family and the broader community in Borden King Cora area who we represented very well, uh, uh, who feel the loss of a very, very spectacular Prince Edward Islander. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And again, I want to thank the Premier for bringing this resolution of sympathy forward for Eric uh, Hamill, uh, who was 91 years old when he passed away, um, Madam Speaker. So he represented the uh, district that we said, Borden uh, Kinkora, um, from 1996 to 2003. He was a pillar of the agriculture community here in Atlantic Canada and his dedication to the agricultural uh, sector on this island will never be forgotten. He was the president of the King Cora Dairy Cooperative, uh, the Atlantic representative on the National Farm Products Marketing Council for nine years. He was the secretary manager for the Prince Edward Island Federation for 12 years. He was, as mentioned, inducted to the Atlantic Agricultural Hall of Fame in 2000, and he was inducted for helping introduce agricultural courses in high schools, uh, promoted the creation of a school milk program, and coordinated the reestablishment of farmers' markets around Prince Edward Island. Um, he also served during a time as a Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, and my condolences and sympathies to his family and friends. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and once again, thank you to the Premier for bringing this uh, resolution of sympathy forward. Eric and his family operated a mixed family farm in Newton, growing potatoes and raising cattle. For many years, he served as Secretary Manager of the Federation of Agriculture, helping to promote the school food program, community farmers markets, farm health and safety programs, and agriculture in the school system. 
He was an active 4-H leader for more than 26 years. That's incredible. And was mentioned in 2000, Eric was inducted into the agriculture, the, sorry, the Atlantic Agricultural Hall of Fame for his lifetime of leadership. In 1996 and in 2000, Eric was elected and board in Kinkora. He served as Minister of Agriculture and Forestry in the government of Premier Pat Binns and helped launch programs to promote crop diversification, develop the beef industry, and revitalize the harness racing industry. My sympathy to his sons, Robert and Preston, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and to all his family and friends. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Gordon, Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I've known Eric for a long while, and uh, he, uh, him and I had a lot of conversations back when I was, uh, when I was policing, but also when I entered into, started getting into politics involved back in 2008, and, and right up until he encouraged me to run in the 2011 election. And uh, we had a lot of conversations together on his front porch. I can picture the place right now in the Nod Road, and uh, uh, we would have coffee out there and we'd chat. And, and one thing about Eric was he, uh, he treated everybody the same. Didn't matter who you were, where you came from, or what you did, um, he treated you the same. Didn't matter what color you were, or what politics you, you know, what didn't matter. He just, he was one of them individuals that was a kind old gentleman that always gave very sound advice and very low key advice um, going forward. And then Eric, he, uh, I missed Eric because he uh, actually, the boundary lines changed. And uh, then it was uh, the honorable member from Rustico Emerald. He, uh, he, uh, he took over the reins with Eric out there on that road. And then uh, in his last days, uh, Eric actually lived in Kensington, in Kensington Malpex area, uh, where he moved out there. And uh, all the best to the family, and uh, uh, he will be missed for sure. Thank you. Shall the motion carry? The Honorable Premier. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Speaker. I move, seconded by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, the following resolution of sympathy. Whereas Alexander James Jim Larkin, former member of the Legislative Assembly for Six Queens from 1979 to 1982, passed away on October the 15th, 2023. Therefore, be it resolved that this House recognize the contributions made by the late member, Mr. Alexander James Jim Larkin, to this province. And Madam Speaker, Jim is someone who I knew uh, very, very well. Uh, for those who might not have known the political side of Jim, because it seems like it was a lifetime ago when he served for many, uh, he was the MLA for District uh, 6, I guess what we call Six Queens, the western side of Charlottetown now, for, for those not familiar with the old dual riding system. Uh, he was an MLA from 1979 to 1982, uh, would have been part of the uh, J. Angus McLean government and then subsequent to the uh, Jim Lee uh, government as uh, Jim took over in 1981. Uh, he was someone who cared deeply about Prince Edward Islanders. Uh, he, was a, he was a good person. Before he was in politics, he was a major contributor to the tourism industry, working as the general manager for TIPI, the Tourism Industry Association of PEI, and he served on the executive of the Tourism Industry Association of Canada. And of course, after politics, he's probably best known for uh, Lobster on the Wharf, McKinnon's Lobster Pound. That was one of the one of the many creations that Jim put his time and effort into. He was the chair of the Charlottetown Area Development Corporation for many years and played an active role in the redevelopment of the Charlottetown waterfront and, and downtown Charlottetown in general. Uh, I used to uh, joke that uh, uh, Jim was from St. Peter's and uh, his wife Helen was from Newport and, and I would often joke that, you know, the boy from Newport met the girl from Newport and what a force they became all across Prince Edward Island and even though they lived in Charlottetown uh, and, and got to be known probably more prominently in the capital city region. Uh, they were rural islanders at heart. They never forgot where they came from. And I want to send my uh, condolences to Helen, the whole family. Uh, Jim was a good, good person, a good man. He was everything he turned his hand to, he was successful at, and he always did it uh, with a smile and a big heart for all islanders. So my condolences to the family. Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and again, thank you to the Premier for uh, bringing this uh, resolution of sympathy uh, forward for James Jim uh, Larkin. Um, as mentioned, he was born in St. Peter's, but he moved to Charlottetown later on, represented six queens uh, here in this legislature. He was a dedicated community leader, a businessman, and a lovely, uh, loving family man. And his passing leaves behind a void that would be felt by all who knew him and all who had worked with him. Um, he was 
known as the king of tourism by his family and friends. He never missed an opportunity to promote the island and its values when he was off the island. Um, he was also, as mentioned, uh, a businessman here in Charlottetown, owner of uh, the landmark seafood restaurant, uh, Lobster on the Wharf. My condolences to his wife, Helen, and his family. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, a graduate of UPEI, Jim worked with the PEI Federation of Municipalities and the Tourism Industry Association of PEI before entering politics. He served as an MLA, as mentioned, for six Queens from 1979 to 1982, was a member of the governments of J. Angus McLean and Jim Lee. Following his time in politics, Jim was well known as an entrepreneur and leader in the island tourism industry, operating McKinnon's Lobster on the Wharf restaurant for many years. His efforts earned him the Premier's Award Tourism for tourism in 2004 in recognition of this leadership. And my son Hunter plays hockey on uh, Jim's grandson Sebastian's team. And I was chatting with uh, Steve, his Jim's son, the other day, and we were just talking about his dad. And, and he told me that tourism is where his heart was always. And uh, you know, he his time in politics he really enjoyed, but tourism was where his heart was. Um, he also served as chair of the Charlottetown Area Development Corporation for many years and was active in the ongoing redevelopment of the Charlottetown waterfront. His work and influence can be felt all over Charlottetown and PEI as he has had his hand in many initiatives with his involvement in the Tourism Association, UPEI Board of Governors, the QEH Foundation, the Charlottetown Chamber of Commerce, Downtown Charlottetown and the PEI Marathon, just to name a few. My condolences go out to his wife, Helen, his children, Kelly, Corinne and Stephen, their grandchildren, their family and friends. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister of Education and Early Years. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, for Premier, for bringing this forward. I, I do want to express my condolences to the family of Jim Larkin. Uh, Jim was an outstanding businessman, an outstanding family man, and he uh, he did our island proud as, uh, in his time in public service. Uh, Jim was also my husband Dennis's uncle and godfather. Uh, he was our friend, he was our mentor, he instilled in us a love for travel. He was one of the first people I spoke to um, when I was considering running in politics. Uh, I, he provided me employment and my husband for many years at Lobster on the Wharf. And in fact, that's where Dennis and I met each other, was at Lobster on the Wharf. So um, to his family, to his friends, Helen, Steve, a lot of you, um, my sincere condolences, he will be forever missed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Michelle Carey. The Honourable Premier, matters of privilege and recognition of guests. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And at the risk of being overexposed, I will <laughs> get back up again and kick off uh, uh, and welcome my colleagues, first of all, back uh, for another uh, important session of debate in our provincial legislature. And as we just witnessed with the Resolutions of sympathy for five uh, former members here that uh, the importance of the work that we all do and the privilege that we get to do it here is something we should always remember uh, because it matters to so many people outside of these walls, Madam Speaker. I would want uh, to say welcome back to the staff, to the media, uh, and to those who are joining us in the public gallery. I see Marlene and Lloyd Bryanton, uh, welcome. I see my friend already recognized, Jason Lee. Uh, Michael Oatway, uh, I see Leo Zank, looks like he's on study break back home, uh, former page in this uh, legislature who can't get enough uh, of it in here. So welcome Leo and to everybody else who is joining us and those who are joining us uh, online. I want to begin by congratulating two individuals who were inducted Saturday night to the Canadian Agriculture <laughs> Hall of Fame, uh, Rory Francis and uh, Robert Irving. Uh, I was surprised to read that uh, only two other islanders before Rory had been inducted to the Canadian uh, Agriculture Hall of Fame, and they were both premiers, Walter Shaw in 1962, or sorry, 1980, and Walter Jones in 1962. And I thought for a place that has made such a contribution to the country and the world in agriculture that maybe we're a little bit underrepresented in the Canadian Agricultural Hall of Fame, uh, Madam Speaker, but uh, to Rory and to Robert and to all of those individuals who have made their careers uh, what they are, I offer my congratulations. I also want to say congratulations to Dave Cameron from King Cora, Katie Baker from Argyle Shore, 
uh, Robert Moore and Ricky Burns from Charlottetown, and the 1969-70 Charlottetown Islanders hockey team, who were recently named as the uh, most recent inductees to the PEI Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, each one of those individuals have, and, and members of that team have given so much to island sport through the years, and they are very deserving of the recognition which will come later on. Uh, to them. Um, also, uh, Madam Speaker, it's that uh, time of year where Three Oaks Senior High School will be hosting their 36th craft fair. It's a two-day event uh, that will begin Saturday, November the 11th from 1 to 9 and continue Sunday on the 12th from 9 to 5. Uh, I'm told this year's event features more than 170 vendors from all around the Maritimes, so there should be some deals there for everybody as we get ready for the Christmas season. Uh, proceeds from this fundraiser go toward a variety of organizations within the school, including student council activities, athletics, and their wonderful band program. And also, uh, Madam Speaker, just before I conclude, I would say that uh, tomorrow at the Confederation Center of the Arts next door, the 2023 Simons Medal Lecture and Presentation will take place uh, inside the Sobeys Family Theater. At 1 p.m., uh, the Simons Medal is one of the most prestigious honors that is presented each year. And this year, the Honorable Michael Ignatiev uh, uh, will be the 23rd uh, recipient. So to all of those at the Confederation Center of the Arts who continue to keep the memory of Tom Simons alive through this medal and lecture series, uh, I look forward to participating in that tomorrow. And I welcome and wish all of my colleagues a very good day and productive debate here in the legislature. Thank you. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I want to welcome you back and all of my colleagues here today. It's been five months uh, since the spring session was over, but it went by very quickly. Uh, we're very busy over the summer uh, talking to islanders and uh, being in our own districts and uh, preparing for this fall session. So we look forward to uh, today being the opening day and to beginning work. But we also want to recognize this week, um, November the 5th to the 11th, as Veterans Week. And Veterans Week provides the opportunity for Canadians to honour the uh, extraordinary um, efforts and sacrifices of our veterans and those who continue to serve. Of course, it's leading up to Remembrance Day on the 11th, where uh, we have to remember and give thanks to those who sacrifice and, and continue to give of themselves uh, this day to give us the uh, to give us the freedoms that we enjoy today. Um, so, Madam Speaker, with that, I'm going to be very brief because we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to, to yourself and to all, all my colleagues. And I'm seeing a bunch of people in the gallery today, Stu Rogers um, and Marlene and Lloyd Bryanton. I see two former pages. Leo, I remember your name, and I'm, I'm so sorry. I am drawing a complete blank. Um, it's really great to see you back here, and, and Jason Lee, of course. Um, and the pages, our new pages, I have loved to welcome you in here. It's really great to have you. And I couldn't help but notice when I came out of the hallway and looked to my left when all the pages were lined up. The very first one was Emmy Stanley, Emmeline. And I taught Emmeline when she was in grade one. And what a treasure she was, and, and I'm sure still is. I haven't spoken to her in a long time, so I look forward to, to meeting all the pages and to chatting with Emmy. She might be embarrassed for me saying this, but we used to have dance breaks in grade one where we turn on the music and just dance. And Emmeline, I would say, was one of the best dancers in the class. Even better than me, Madam Speaker. I know. Um, so, as was mentioned, this week is Veterans Week um, for 2023, and tonight at the Trailside Music Hall, Veteran Affairs Canada are hosting an open mic. This open mic is hosted by Dennis McKenzie. It's for veterans, current serving members, and family to showcase their talents via storytelling and songs, um, and the regimental band will also be performing. And this is from Veterans Affairs, a brief description. The intention of the event is to provide veterans with a casual alternative to the traditional commemorative ceremony and to recognize the important role music plays in the healing process and bringing people together. Veterans, current serving members, and their guests are invited to an evening where they will have the opportunity to share stories and songs or simply enjoy the music of others. And uh, back in October, singer-songwriter Scott Parsons from Charlottetown was one of the three islanders to receive the order of PEI. And this Friday evening, Scott will be presenting a Remembrance Day show at King's Playhouse in Georgetown. And the show is entitled, And the Land Rested from War, Stories and Songs for My Father, and is also presented in partnership with Veterans Affairs Canada. 
uh, the production weaves stories of Scott's father, Ivan Benny Parsons, captured in video by the Heroes Remember Veterans Affairs Canada project with Scott's own stories and songs. This fitting tribute to his father's military service is on stage in Georgetown Friday, this Friday evening. And uh, also tonight is the last night of screening for uh, local PEI filmmakers on the, the movie Who's Your Father? And it's playing at the Cineplex Theatre at 6.30. Uh, this this, this uh, production, this movie was written and directed by PEI filmmaker Jeremy Larder, produced by Jenna McMillan, also an Islander, and features film stars such as Chris Locke, Susan Kent, Jess Aguero, and Kenny Etio Horn. And so uh, if you haven't been to see that yet, tonight would be your last night to catch that at the Cineplex. And I wish all of my colleagues and everyone tuning in uh, a great day. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, I remember from Surrey Elmira. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker. We'll try this again. I apologize for my uh, rambunctious uh, nature earlier. I'm just excited to get going. Uh, good afternoon to everyone in beautiful District 1. Good afternoon to everyone here in the gallery, especially our former page, Marissa Hallett. It's nice to have you here. Um, welcome back to all my colleagues on both sides of the floor. And uh, it's, uh, it's good to be back here in the legislature after a busy summer. I hope everyone enjoyed some quality time with family and friends and got to enjoy some of our beautiful summer weather. Uh, we have lots of issues in front of us and looking forward to a very productive fall session. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We have a member from Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd just like to welcome everybody back, and uh, I made everybody had a busy summer, and if it wasn't quite busy enough, I just want to let everybody know that Summerside's still hopping. We have the World Under-17 Hockey Challenge, they're co-hosting with Charlottetown, which we see in Canada White beat the U.S. last night in a shootout. And uh, also the NCAA uh, Women's National Soccer Championships are going to be hosted, co-hosted again up in Summerside, and uh, that's going to be played on the turf field. So there's lots happening in Summerside for everybody to take in. Uh, the Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks, Madam. It's lovely to hear the, the name of my, uh, <laughs> my district mentioned. It doesn't happen too often. Um, it's a pleasure to rise today. I want to welcome you back, Madam Speaker, the staff of the Legislature, everybody in the gallery. Uh, I see Michael Oatway from Montague. Lovely that you made it today, Michael and Stu Rogers and Jason Lee, of course, and Leo and many others. And it's lovely to see a full gallery. Thank you for being here today. And I also uh, want to welcome the new pages to their positions. Uh, it's an exciting place to be. Um, we've had many condolences and commemorations offered today. And I want to add to that by uh, speaking about my dear friend John Robinson, who passed away last week. John was not actually a constituent of mine, but he lived not far. And uh, I knew John uh, initially through our work together at the Victoria Playhouse, but also through his work in agriculture here, through his over 20 years of volunteering in the Community Foundation here on Prince Edward Island. And of course, he and his wife Hazel were recipients of the Order of Canada back in just last year, I believe, from Governor General Mary Simon. And the, the motto of the Order of Canada is that they desired a better country. And in John's, um, in the obituary for John uh, that I saw, it said that he was touched by that motto. But I would also say that he lived by that motto. Everything John did was to improve his community, both locally across this province and indeed uh, across this country. And the Premier mentioned earlier about our underrepresentation at the Canadian Agricultural Hall of, Hall of Fame. And I would suggest that John would fit in beautifully there. His contribution to agriculture here on the island was tremendous. And um, I will miss him. I pass on my love and my condolences to, a to Hazel and to his children, uh, Deborah, Alan, and Mary, and uh, I really wish them well. He's a great loss to this province. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, honorable members, sorry, we're, we're making this really lengthy, but I'm going to stand as well and welcome everyone here in the gallery. Uh, the Bryantons, uh, Marlene and Lloyd, I've been following uh, your journey on Facebook, and uh, you have my, my thoughts and my prayers, and hopefully we can uh, do something to make a difference in Andrew's life. Uh, Leo, welcome back, uh, constituent of mine. Uh, Jason, who I've known for a long time, and um, everyone else in the gallery, and everyone watching from District 4, Belfast, Mary River. I don't get to say that very often as, uh, as well. Um, 
Uh, we have two new uh, employees in the Legislative Assembly. Uh, we have Anne Marie Sheen, who's executive uh, assistant. She joins us from the Human Rights Commission. And Denise Duran, uh, Human Resources uh, Administrator, who joins us from the Public Service Commission. So I want to welcome them. I thought maybe they'd join us in here, but I'm sure they're watching. And uh, welcome to uh, the Legislative Assembly staff. Uh, everyone here, uh, welcome back. And let's get on with the show. <laughs> Uh, statements by members, beginning with the Leader of the Opposition. I have the very clear impression that the members of this government had a very relaxing summer. So many fundamental issues were left to one side, and that list of challenges is getting very long. Housing, homelessness, addictions, challenges in mental health, long-standing problems with the lack of access to health care. And of course, Madam Speaker, there is the awful problem with the Charlottetown Outreach Centre and the terrible divisions that have been created among communities. In many ways, Madam Speaker, each of these issues is a clear and a present challenge to this government and to our province. People are getting concerned. Cost of living is deepening the pressures of many Islanders and their families, and they should be able to rely on a government that has its hands on the wheel. Islanders are worried because it, to many of their friends, families, and neighbors, they can't get access to the health care services that they need. And many, many Islanders are deeply upset at government's tragic mishandling of the Outreach Center and its failed support for vulnerable people. The city of Charlottetown has been badly treated. Vulnerable Islanders have not had access to safe, professional services, and worst of all, this government's mishandling of this file has created deep division and even deeper discontent. In late 2023, we had great challenges across the planet. War rages and democracy is under attack. Once upon a time, it seemed like they were safe from those challenges, Madam Speaker. We could rely on governments that kept the foundation repaired and the machinery maintained. But now, now we have a do-nothing government, and I'm very worried about the risks of this inactivity, this lack of ambition, and this complete unwillingness to offer leadership in difficult times. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Madam Speaker, in many ways, I believe this government has a real problem here in concerns of many Islanders. The Premier and his ministers compliment themselves on listening to experts but do they hear the voices of everyday people? <coughs> Let me quote from a letter written by Birchwood Junior High School Home and School, quote, dating back to the Community Average Center moving to the old curling club in 2021, no one from the school or surrounding community was consulted. Mm -hmm. Further, I quote, the school staff are now required to patrol the grounds at break, early morning, at lunchtime, all the way down to Ken's Corner to ensure the safety of our students. Further, I quote again, we are robbing our kids of a wonderful experience of attending Birchwood Junior High. Finally, I quote, our students are scared. Madam Speaker, a government that listens would have heard these voices long ago. They would have heard from parents doing their best to raise their kids and contribute to a healthy, diverse community. And we all know how difficult it can be growing up, doing schoolwork, making friends, figuring out a complex world. It's a challenging time, and as adults, we have a real responsibility to make this period enjoyable, productive, and educational. This government looked away from those responsibilities. They chose to do nothing. Well, the problem grew and festered and chipped away of the positive experience of young people should have. And let me tell you, Madam Speaker, the people with the authority and decision-making should have done a lot more to protect the innocence and safety of our children. We are faced today with a government that didn't listen, didn't act, to engage their well-being and did not hear the voices that spoke so loudly about division, trauma, and fear. I will table this letter today, Madam Speaker, and I look forward to questioning the members of Cabinet on the actions over the last several years. The government may not listen, but they will have to because, hey, it's about the people, isn't it? Questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
On Friday past, the Premier and his Minister of Housing held quite the press conference, announcing their grand plan to move the Outreach Centre from its current location to Park Street. They seem to think that this will solve all the headaches that their do-nothing approach has caused for the residents of Charlottetown and Outreach Centre clients alike. Madam Speaker, we'll get into more deal detail on this government's failures and contradictions on this topic shortly, but I wanted to flag one quote from this press conference off the top. The Premier said on the topic of the current Euston Street location that his government selected without any consultation, and I quote, I would surely feel the same way if this was beside my home, end quote. My question is to the Premier. So it's unacceptable for you and your family, but the people who live in downtown Charlottetown have been putting up with this for years. So why do you see it as fair that this is unacceptable for you, but it's okay for the thousands of people who live in Charlottetown to have the current centre in their neighbourhood? Honourable Premier. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank the Honourable Leader for his question. It, it's, these are important questions about uh, very important issues that our province is dealing with, uh, not exclusively because uh, it's what's happening in other jurisdictions across the region and the country and beyond. Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, this is a very difficult and emotional issue. I think as government, your job is to try to do the best you can for the most, and in doing so, you know that people are going to be impact in that decision-making process. Uh, I wish there were simple and easy answers for these uh, issues, Madam Speaker, but they're not. These issues are on our shores. They're not going away, uh, Madam Speaker, and we're trying to work with as many professional groups and others as we can to do the best we can to deliver these services to vulnerable islanders, Madam Speaker, and I'm open uh, and uh, to any good ideas, Madam Speaker, that can help us in that regard. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And the best you can do is, is just kick it down the road to another neighbourhood. That's the best you can do. You must be able to do better than that. It's quite clear now that this government's do-nothing approach is causing problems right across this island, Madam Speaker. We see it in health care, housing, mental health and addictions. And as the problems grow, the government appears increasingly paralysed and it's running out of options. A few days ago, the Premier announced his plan to move the Community Outreach Centre to the old government garage on Park Street. My question for the Premier, if the City of Charlottetown does not agree to this idea, what is your backup plan? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I appreciate uh, the question, and there are difficult uh, uh, scenarios and, and questions and issues we're dealing with. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, we're uh, trying to uh, provide these necessary services uh, as close to possible where the population is located. Uh, the city of Charlottetown is our largest centre. It's where the bulk of our population and the growth of our population is coming, and this is where uh, these things tend to uh, uh, be here in, in, in cities that are growing, such as Charlottetown is. Uh, we're trying to... Uh, uh, relocate temporarily to Park Street because, as we all know, the operators, the adventure group, all of the people who are accessing the current uh, outreach centre on Houston Street and, and the neighbourhood around it know that that isn't the right decision, place for it. Uh, and so we're trying to find a place to relocate it on a temporary basis until we can come up with a long-term solution so we can offer these services to be integrated within our community, to be as safe uh, as possible for those who need to access the service and those who, 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 who uh, live around it, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. And we do so in knowing that uh, it's going to be a conversation that's going to continue. It's not going to be something that everybody is going to agree on, but we're trying to find the solutions within that to provide this necessary service, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On Friday, the Premier said, and I quote, if the relocation of the Outreach Centre is accepted by the City, we will make a temporary move. If it isn't, I don't know where we'll go from here or what the next solution is. Madam Speaker, this is a result of a do-nothing government, mm. a government that has avoided its responsibilities and run out of options. Premier, surely there must be some work being done to prepare a, black, a backup plan that addresses the needs of the vulnerable while protecting the interests of residents. What is that plan? The Honourable Premier. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. As I say, it is a very important question and, and very important issue uh, that impacts Islanders. Uh, uh, we are trying to provide this necessary service to vulnerable Islanders who need 
this service. Uh, what takes place within the walls of the adventure group is helping a lot of vulnerable islanders get on the path to dealing with a lot of the challenges that they face. But we also know that the area has become a collection for everything around mental health and addictions, and we're working with our partners and others to try to find a way to provide these services uh, uh, so they're needed, but to do so in a way that's cohesive and we can do so in an integrated way within the city. Uh, one of the individuals that we're bringing on, Ms. Carlene Donnelly, has done this in Calgary, uh, and uh, we're hoping uh, that uh, she can be an anchor in this for us to, um, uh, to deliver this important service and to find a way to uh, make sure that uh, those who live around the system, around the service, are... Honorable members? Premier has the floor. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Uh, so those who live in near and around the, the can, can do so and live uh, a, a good, full, safe life. Uh, we also need to make sure that those who are accessing the uh, services have an accountability component to what we expect from them, uh, Madam Speaker. So uh, th that's what our plan is. Uh, I'm hoping that we will be granted a temporary uh, uh, variance on that property so we can relocate the services as soon as possible. And in the process of doing that, we're trying to find a long-term solution for a very complex uh, societal issue, Madam Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. I'm sure going to make myself and Islanders feel confident that your plan is hope. So back on Friday, the Premier said that the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor of Charlottetown were not involved in the announcement to move to the Every Centre. Um, Premier, you said that the City was informed on Thursday the day before the announcement, and it was just as a courtesy. So will the Premier please tell this House what sort of response that he got from the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor? The Honourable Premier. Uh, well, Madam Speaker, uh, uh, when you're dealing with uh, uh, an entity like the City of Charlottetown, for example, when you're dealing with something like a temporary variance, uh, it is uh, the Council and the Mayor aren't necessarily always involved in saying, let's pick this location and then take it to council to try to get a location approved for a temporary variance. So we've had conversations with the mayor, with the deputy mayor, with city officials for a number of weeks now. I think we all recognize two or three very important principles is that the current location isn't working and needs to be relocated as soon as possible, that we need to continue to offer this service to vulnerable islanders and we need to find a way to do so so that residents uh, can be safe on their homes and on the streets uh, and in their neighborhoods, uh, Madam Speaker. So I outlined that process because I know in my experience dealing with the Minister of Housing and Land and Communities, who used to be a member of City Council, that it's a constant challenge for them and they get reprimanded from their legal counsel, for example, if they're involved in a decision to do so prior to this. So what we did was we informed the mayor that we were going to make this temporary variance. Now the city will have to deal with that and go through its process. We hope we can get it done, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, but that is the process uh, that we have to go through. And as, uh, you know, if we could do this, Without having to involve another layer of government, we would, but that's the process we have to do to find a place within the city of Charlottetown, Madam Speaker, to rezone the property. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I find this a little confusing. You see, on October the 26th, a week before the Outreach Centre announcement, government sent uh, the city a communications plan, and in that it outlined the announcement in great detail. The Premier was to be at the announcement, the Minister of Housing, the Chief of Charlottetown Police, the Mayor, and so on and so on. It was quite a complicated, complicated plan, Madam Speaker, so I'm confused. Premier, if you only mentioned it to the City on November the 2nd, why was a communications plan provided to the City on October the 26th? Oh. The Honourable Premier. Yeah, Madam Speaker, it is a complicated uh, uh, file. I, I think we have uh, been trying to have a coordinated approach as much as we can with the City of Charlottetown uh, and knowing that the municipal government has a role to play here, as does the provincial government and, and so many other layers, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to, instead of what has been a 
the appearance in public of the city being against the province and vice versa, and, and, and one being accused of downloading this to make a decision on the other. We're trying to come up with a cohesive plan to go forward where we can deal with this important societal issue that we have to deal with. It isn't going away. We can't ignore it. We have to deal with it, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and we're going to work with as many partners as we can, including the city of Charlottetown and others, to make sure we do the best job we can in delivering that service, Madam Speaker. Leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, so this didn't need to be complicated. It was this government that made it complicated, Madam Speaker. And I will quote from the communications plan, and I will table it later, Madam Speaker, because it is it's a fascinating <coughs> document. The plan says that homelessness, mental health, substance misuse, and addictions continue to be a growing concern in Prince Edward Island. The current economic and social environment is not creating the conditions to reverse these trends. My question. Is this the true face of a do-nothing government? Is this the way you plan? You, you say that economic and social conditions aren't helping. But where is the government? Doesn't the Premier think that government has a more significant role in these matters? And Premier, will you admit now that your do-nothing approach has contributed to these failures? The Honourable Premier. Oh, well, Madam Speaker, I would say that we're trying our very best to deal with this very complex issue. Uh, I think it's something that we have been working on for the last three years. Uh, I'm, I'm the first to say, and I've said it many times, that it, we haven't gotten it perfect here yet, to say the least. Uh, we're working hard to try to do the best we can to uh, challenge ourselves and, and to make sure we respond to the challenge that's out there from community and others to provide this necessary service to those vulnerable islanders who need it, to have compassion for those and their families who are dealing with these very, very difficult issues that nobody sets out in life to partake in, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, and, and we've been working really, really, uh, really, really diligently on that. It's a, it, it is a complicated file. And I would have to say that I can't imagine that the Leader of the Opposition would disagree with anything within that statement that would talk about the realities of what people are dealing with in this day and age, Madam Speaker. I would find it hard to believe he could find any disagreement in that statement. I'm the Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, I, I hear them every day of the realities. I have so many stories, and if we can get our motion on the floor today, you will hear them. So, Madam Speaker, on Friday, the Premier said he met with all kinds of experts over the summer, trying to find a solution to a problem created by his do-nothing government, who had three years as a pilot program, three years to get this right. Will the Premier please find the relevant, the relevant sections of his calendar that indicate precisely where these meetings took place? How long were they? And table those in the House tomorrow. The Honourable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, I talked to thousands of islanders and others. Uh, matter of fact, whenever we are within proximity to people who are dealing with issues such as this, it's one of the first things that I always ask to get advice from. When I was at the Council of uh, 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 Premiers, uh, the Federation, we, we talked exclusively with the new uh, Premier of Manitoba, for example, Mr. S uh, Madam Speaker, who's dealing with this in a big way in, in centres like Winnipeg, for example. Uh, I talked to uh, some of my counterparts. I know the Governor of Maine is seeing an explosion of societal challenges in places like Portland and Bangor. Uh, so we're constantly trying to work and share best practices and get some good ideas along the way. But Madam Speaker, I will go through my calendar and whatever relevant information I can share. Uh, my calendar's online as far as I know, but I will talk to my Executive Assistant Crystal and whatever information I can share here, I'd be very happy to. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The communication plan that I spoke about earlier um, also said the situation is escalating. Now, let me repeat this. The situation is escalating. And in the face of that confession, the government appears with a communications plan, an announcement that relies on the city to agree to participate in its failures. So will the Premier provide this House by tomorrow with a fully updated plan that lays out government's intentions, <coughs> its plans, and its options? Will you do that, Premier? The Honourable Premier. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I, I, I would hope the Honourable Leader of the Opposition wouldn't disagree with the fact that tensions have intensified here. I think that is a common uh, stated fact that you wouldn't need a read from any document uh, to... Uh, 
to comprehend and understand. I think what government is trying to do is we're trying to find a solution in real time to a very complex societal challenge in which there are no simple answers for. I say we're trying to base our approach on the fact that the current location doesn't work and needs to move. We need to offer this services within the proximity of downtown somewhere so that the vulnerable islanders can access these needed services. And we need to help make sure that those people who might be living in, in, in proximity to these services have a chance to have a good life so they can be free and move around their communities and do so safely. Uh, and, and that is a very complex challenge, Madam Speaker, that we're working on each and every day. Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For close to three years, we've heard growing concerns about the outcry from residents in Charlottetown about the failures of the Conservative Government Community Outreach Centre. This do-nothing government has abandoned Charlottetown and allowed their inactions and indecisions to foster an unsafe and healthy environment for Outreach Centre clients, residents, community, and a number of schools. Question to the Minister of Education. How many complaints has your department received from parents, students, teachers, administrators, or staff about the deteriorate circumstances they face in light of your government's mismanagement and poor oversight of the provincial community every center. The Honourable Minister of Education, early years. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. And I was very pleased to meet with you a couple of months ago um, regarding this important topic, as well as many others. Uh, as it relates to the exact number, um, Madam Speaker, certainly we can go back to the department and, and try to get a better insight in terms of uh, correspondence. That being said, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, myself directly, I have visited um, both schools, Prince Street and Birchwood, and have had a number of uh, different conversations with the administrators there. I've visited with many families, Madam Speaker. I visited the out Outreach Center. I visited with uh, Roxanne Carter Thompson with the Outreach Center, Madam Speaker. So I'm uh, very aware of the issue, and I know um, that uh, my cabinet, the Minister of Housing as well, we're, we're adamantly um, concerned about it, and we recognize that we need to move the location of it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlton West Royalty. Madam Speaker, a letter was sent to the Health and Social Development Committee, which I'll table later, let it later um, from Birchwood Home and School outlining some ghastly scenarios that the school community faced on a daily basis. Staff being asked to sweep for needles, condoms and crack pipes. Teachers being forced to police the school property for trespassers. Students accidentally handling used needles. These stories are horrific for any parent educator to hear. Question to the Minister. How many instances of discarded needles being found by school staff has Birchwood or Princewood School, Prince Street School, have you been made aware of as Minister? Minister of Education, early years. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker, and again, thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. I know that the staff, um, they do supervise the area regularly, and they are constantly doing inspections of the school grounds, um, Madam Speaker. I know that we've had increased uh, supervision presence along around the uh, school uh, boundaries, and recently we did uh, enact a fence around Prince Street School. Again, after having spoken with the principal, I know that that was something that was very important for them, so that uh, that that fence is in order now. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Nothing like getting to the point where we have to put fences up in elementary schools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's going to be a solution. Madam Speaker, the Outreach Centre is mandated to provide government with <coughs> incident reports every month and develop an associated safety plan. Question to the <coughs> Minister. How many of these incident reports have you received and reviewed as Minister of Education? Minister of Education, early years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. None that I'm aware of. <coughs> Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Here's the problem, is that nobody's communicating to each other. These are mandated. We're talking about this kind of situation that we're in. We don't even have the data. We haven't even shared it with the Minister of Education when there's a school 100 metres away. I, I just don't, I don't understand it. Madam Speaker, I'm going to read a short quote from the Minister she made only two months ago. We are excited to welcome everyone back to school. We have listened to the needs of our school community as we move into the school year. Our aim is to set our students up for success both emotionally and academically. Question to the Minister, how do you justify this statement when a school property that needs to be swept for needles, condoms, crack pipes daily with setting up for students for success both emotionally and academically? 
Federal Minister of Education Early Years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do want to commend the school staff. Honestly, they have done a tremendous job um, in at both Prince Street and Birchwood School and across our province. And you know, in, in going around these lap, last couple months and meeting with school staff and meeting with families and meeting with students, we have had a successful beginning to our school year. Madam Speaker, we are facing some challenges in these communities, and we all recognize this, and that's why we're going to have to work together in order to uh, achieve better, more positive outcomes for the residents in this area and all Islanders, Madam Speaker. There's been a number of different protocols in place, Madam Speaker, where our schools are locked. There's an intercom system at our schools. We've had uh, police uh, in to do presentations to our students to ensure that they're educated around making safe decisions on and off the school grounds. As I said previously, we've added extra uh, staff, staff supervision uh, to do inspections, police presence around the schools. We've constructed the fence and we have protocols in place, Madam Speaker, on, in all areas. So again, I do think that it has been a very successful um, school year thus far and I, I acknowledge that we have to continue to work on this together collectively in this House and I'm glad the Honourable Member is bringing forward these con concerns. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Charlottetown West Road. I don't know if that's reassuring. I, I mean, I'm hearing all kinds of different things from, from the police, from the students. I'm reading from a letter from Home and School, which, which table in every Islander should read, that it's not matching up with what you're saying. And I'm going to ask a question to the Premier as my final question. Premier, you talked about your family and your son going to UPEI over issues there. What would you say if, you're, if your kids are going to Birchwood Junior High when kids are scared, when Home and School is coming to you and saying, hey, this is a problem? What do you say to your parents, what do you say to the parents who are bringing these concerns to you, to the feet of your government, to the opposition about solving this problem? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would say to them that I, uh, my heart goes out to them and that we're trying to work as fast as we can to relocate from the, situ uh, from the uh, property at Houston Street to tamp down a lot of those issues that they're dealing with and as fast as we can move out of there uh, on a temporary basis, I think it will be good. I think it will, be, uh, it will help uh, minimize the impacts to those two schools that are uh, located in the middle of this. So I would encourage those on city council to support the temporary move so we can get it relocated. And I would encourage everybody in this legislature to support that and to come forward, not just with questions, but some, some pot potential answers answers and solutions so we can deal with this complex issue of management. They're very, very, very complex. They're difficult. There are no easy solutions, but we're open to anyone who might have some solutions here who can help, Madam Speaker, so we can relocate the property from where it is and to make sure we uh, provide that important service to those most vulnerable islanders who need it. Honourable Member. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Madam Speaker, and I have to say, listening to these answers, I've, I'm going to continue down the same path, and I have a lot of comments that I need to keep to myself for now, but I will have the opportunity. The first community outreach centre opened in 2020 as a pilot project in a temporary location. Now, three years later, it is moving to its fourth temporary location, which is totally 100% reliant on the approval from Charlottetown City Council. Four time, fourth time is a charm, said no one ever. Question to the Minister of Housing, Community and Land. This government has had almost four years. What do you actually expect to change by doing very little else but moving the service to another temporary location just down the road? General Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I think um, if you listen to our announcement um, last week, uh, the the move, the the application we're making to make the move to Park Street is is one part of the plan to hit the reset button here, take a hard look at the model that we're using to deliver these services and um, think about how we can do this better going forward. Uh, I think I recognized last week that we can do better. We can do better for the people who have endured some very difficult months and years in the vicinity of the current location. We can do better for the people who need to access those services. And the move, the temporary move to Park Street is, is just one step in that process that we're embarking on. And um, I look forward to working with our partners in the community, with our new advisor who I met with this morning, 
to, to move forward and improve these services in a very complex and quickly changing world. Madam Leader, the third party for supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so I'd like to welcome Roxanne Carter-Thompson, who just, who just walked in and who was delivering these crucial services to Islanders. The government announced the centre as a pilot project back in 2020, as I mentioned. By definition, a pilot has goals. Objectives, outcomes laid out by government. This gives us something to measure, measure to ensure that services are effective, that there's enough of them, and that they're having the desired outcomes as laid out. Question to the Minister, what have you been measuring all this time? What have you learned from this, and how is this informing you moving forward? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Of course, um, the measurement of outcomes is important, and um, we continue to collect data uh, about all the services we deliver to our vulnerable populations uh, in the province. And it will be an important part of, of looking at how we can do better going forward, using da a data-driven model that we can use to prove outcomes uh, and change our delivery of services so that we're getting the best outcomes possible. Uh, you know, uh, we, I, I understand that it's been an extremely difficult time uh, this summer, particularly. Uh, I think I know we can do better, and uh, you know, based on the conversations I've had over the last uh, several weeks, and particularly this morning, having sat down with Carlene Donnelly, who will be advising us going forward. I have hope that we're moving in a better direction. We'll be on a, a stable path forward soon. And um, uh, and I'm looking forward to that process. I have a leader of the third party, your second supplementary. Madam Speaker, this has been difficult because your government's not lis listening and they're not asking. They keep doing the same things over and over again without talking to people. Moving the centre to a new, t and I'd love for you to table your d what you're collecting, oh, because I feel like this is the alternative caregiver program all over again. There's nothing actually on paper. I'd love to see it on paper if it actually exists. Moving the centre to a new temporary location does nothing to support the clients or to address the problems that Charlottetown residents have been experiencing. Our Charlottetown Chief of Police has told us that we cannot police our way out of this. We need to start dealing with the fundamental issues. This government did not appeal the overdose prevention site rejection. They, did, they have not added detox treatment beds. They have broken their promise of an expedited mental health hospital and they have driven our island into a worsening housing crisis, cost of living crisis and health care crisis. A question to the Premier, is this the type of legacy you want to leave for our province? The Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, I continue to say these are very, very complex issues that we're trying to deal with uh, that are very, very emotional and have become very, very divisive within our society. Uh, I would again uh, uh, ask Islanders to remember who we are, to remember that we should have compassion for those individuals who need help, those most vulnerable who need this. Uh, these are Islanders. I drive by that site and there are people I went to school with. I know them well uh, and no one sets out in life to struggle with mental health and addictions and homelessness, Madam Speaker. Uh, we're working hard to, to address a number of these challenges. They are very, very complex. They're very, very difficult and as we've heard in here, there are many, many questions and it's easy to point the finger and that's fine. That's the role of people in here, but solutions are also important, Madam Speaker, and I would say we're open to any and all solutions that would help us relocate as quickly as possible from Houston Street and provide this service to vulnerable islanders who need it in the capital region, Madam Speaker. Gavel member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yesterday, government uh, posted numbers of new health care hires totaling over 500. The Minister was all too happy to share that information, but less so when it comes to how many of those folks are currently working here, what percentage of those positions are part-time, whether they have a contract, or how many healthcare workers have left the system. It's unhelpful to present only part of the picture because ultimately what Islanders really want to know is, is my access to healthcare better than it was? Not. To the Minister of Health and Wellness, is the patient registry shorter? Are emergency rooms less overcrowded? Have wait times decreased for surgeries? In short, is Islanders' access to health care better than it was? Yeah, 
Minister of uh, Health. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, it was important to release uh, those employment numbers to show our health uh, workforce that we are making uh, improvements in our system. We are uh, bringing down pathways um, in order to bring more people into the system. Are they all on the ground yet? No, they're not. Um, but it's important, I think, from my conversations through my tour, is that many of those health care workers weren't, avail weren't aware of the IEN program and reduced pathways. So I think it's important to communicate that we're making strides and it is getting better from a staffing perspective. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> now a member from New Haven Rock Point for supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And of course, it must be tempting for the Health Minister to want to get some good news out there. I get that. We've had years of deteriorating service, broken promises, and unhappy workers complaining about the toxic culture in the healthcare system. And amongst the cherry-picked numbers we got yesterday is a cohort of foreign graduates from Dubai and Singapore, and the Minister just mentioned that. This spring, we were assured that some of these nurses would be working on Prince Edward Island here today, but as far as I and anybody else can figure, that's not, that's not one of them has seen an island patient yet. To the same Minister, how many of the 547 hires um, that were announced yesterday are actually currently working in our public health system? Minister of uh, Health and thank Wellness. you, Madam Speaker. Sorry. And obviously, there is challenges with the immigration pathway. I think we know that in Canada. And again, that is not that's a federal responsibility. So again, we can continue to work with uh, immigration. I am pleased to note that the Liberal government, uh, federal government, uh, in increased the uh, express entry pathway from 4,000 to 8,000 healthcare workers this year. That target. Um, I asked the federal minister when he was in Charlottetown a couple weeks ago uh, on where they were on that, and he was going to get back to me. So. I will reach out to see what that pathway is, re is, uh, is doing for us. But again, we have to go through the immigration uh, system. But I guess my best comment was to say is we're not doing the same thing over and over again. We've increased new pathways to increase our workforce. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. If that's your best comment, we're in trouble, Minister. And you talk about the struggles and the challenges with immigration, and I absolutely agree with you. Nova Scotia recently hired about 200 foreign-trained nurses who were already living in that province. When Prince Edward Island goes after nurses in Dubai and Singapore, for example, as we have done and continue to do, there are inevitably immigration-related challenges, as well as issues, for example, with finding housing. A question to the same minister. Why doesn't our province actively recruit trained foreign nurses who are already residents of Prince Edward Island, just like Nova Scotia did? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So actually, again, uh, we have an integration to practice pathway. We've signed an agreement with the University of Saskatchewan in order to uh, provide these nurses with a provisional license first so they can move into the workforce. So again, those hurdles have been taken down uh, both by the college and by government. So we appreciate what the college has done in order to expedite that. So we are well, ready, willing, and able to hire any nurse, uh, where, whether they live on Prince Edward Island or whether they live in Canada or anywhere else in the world. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Madam Speaker, um, the Mental Health Act is an important piece of legislation that governs how persons who are living with this complex health situation are treated. I'm glad that the government is committed to modernizing the Mental Health Act, and I can appreciate what a complicated balancing act it must be to find when you are dealing with the issues of capacity, personal autonomy, and safety. My question is to the Minister of Health. What are the criteria currently used under the Mental Health Act to determine when an individual is deemed to require hospitaliz hospitalization due to self-harm? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Obviously, it's a, it's a timely issue, and, and our staff has spent a lot of time um, both on, on bringing the new Mental Health Act forward, so I'd like to thank uh, the staff we work shoulder to shoulder with. Uh, to answer your question, obviously, there's involuntary admission and there's voluntary admission um, currently in our Act. Um, on the involuntary admission side, uh, basically, it's about personal safety or harm to others that we would uh, work on that criteria. And in voluntary uh, admission, it's pretty straightforward that you're suffering from a mental disorder, um, you're in need of, of psychiatric treatment, and that you're suitable for admission as a voluntary patient. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, remember, I'm Charlton Belvedere, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. These are complex issues for families, clinicians, the courts, and others who wrestle with both who wrestle with, both here on Prince Edward Island and elsewhere. Question to the Minister of Health. Who determines that criteria? Honourable oh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it's important to be clear that the criteria is set out in the Act, uh, which is approved here in the Legislative Assembly. Again, I think we all recognize that the current Mental Health Act is very old. I think it's almost 30 years old. Um, it needs to be updated, so I'm pleased that we'll uh, address this very important issue in the coming days. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There have been calls made to expand the criteria used to determine self-harm so as to grant greater latitude in making determination that someone may require psychiatric care. This can be further complicated when a person's condition is changing and evolving. Question to the Minister of Health. How important is the clinician's assessment of a patient's condition to determine whether the ministerial directive or order would be needed? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I want to acknowledge, I don't want to speak about a specific issue that our department has dealt with, but again, I want to thank our department who put countless hours in in, in the last few weeks on this file. Um, I was yawning a little bit today at Cabinet, and it was because of the late nights and working with staff. So again, I want to thank them for everything that they've done over the last week or two uh, to move through this act. But to answer your question, it's always about the best interest of the patient. So for me, I would always uh, rely on the clinical assessment um, of, of the clinicians that are involved in any case. Uh, they are the experts, and we need to trust the experts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, they say few things travel faster than a good rumor, and I sure saw evidence of that this weekend. A series of posts surfaced online saying that the province was busing clients of the Community Outreach Centre to the Rolla Bay Inn. The rumor mill took a life of its own, in short order, fed by the misinformation of a few online, and today I wanted to officially clear the air for my constituents. So my question is to the Minister of Housing, Lands and Communities, whom I've already had conversations on this with, but would like to have it on the public record. Are clients of the Community Outreach Centre being transported to the Rolla Bay Inn or any other location in my district and housed there at the taxpayer's expense? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The answer is no. Um, the province is not transporting clients from the outreach center to the Rolla Bay Inn, although we do know that uh, it, that's a site that we use from time to time uh, as needs arise and facilitated through our shelter support line uh, that we do house people there uh, on, a, on a temporary basis from time to time. The Honourable Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member. So, in short, the province has not been paying to bus and house outreach centre clients at the Roll of the Inn. Thank you. Can I finish my the question? The member has the floor, honourable members. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So my question is to the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Does your department have any plans to house outreach centre clients at the Roll of the Inn in the future? The honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Um, as I indicated, we, uh, we do uh, uh, house people at, at that particular location. Um, I prefer not to uh, discuss specific locations where we, we house clients, but uh, seeing that it's out in the open now, uh, we'll, um, I, I will say that um, I, I, I resent the, well, I, I I have some issues with um, with the question about who we should and shouldn't uh, house in any in any part of the of the uh, of the province. The the insinuation is that people that use the outreach center are somehow should be uh, cast aside or uh, uh, are undesirable in some way, and that's definitely not the case, as I can uh, attest. Um, but. 
when we do have to use temporary uh, facilities like that, and it's facilitated by calls to our shelter support line, uh, it's uh, in that case it would be people from the community and from the area who are staying there. And if they, if it, if there was a hap if it happened to be a coincidence that it that person may have used the services of the community outreach in Charlottetown at some point, so be it. They wouldn't be calling a shelter support line if they weren't a vulnerable person in need. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member. So, I am aware that the province has used this property previously to meet the local housing needs in our community. So the question, and the Minister uh, has answered it, um, how does your department work with the Rolla Bay Inn to support the housing needs of Islanders? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Yeah, and uh, as I've indicated, and we've been through this before in this House, that um, uh, we, we do use the services of, uh, of private facilities like this. We have arrangements with them on a, on, to use them from time to time on a temporary basis to, to house people who are in need of uh, housing support. And uh, often that is just for a short time. Uh, and often it's families because we do not put families in emergency shelters. When there's a family with children, we, we seek out opportunities like uh, uh, hotels and motels uh, to, to house people in, in emergency situations like this. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, final you. question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So it's a little bit confusing about this communications plan and what the Premier is now saying here today. Um, earlier he said that the, the centre should be in, in Charlottetown, um, easily accessible. Um, but the communications plan that he sent out on October 26 says, and I quote, these challenges also exist in communities outside the capital city and programs and services are required island-wide. So my question is for the Premier. Your total mishandling of this file means that very few organizations, communities, or individuals want anything to do with your plans. It's not that people don't want to help. They just don't want to have anything to do with this particular brand of collaboration. So how, Mr. Uh, Premier, how do you go about building trust in your efforts to spread the outreach model across Prince Edward Island? The Honourable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, I would say it would be a sad day in this province if communities and individuals aren't interested in collaboration in the best interests of those islanders, particularly those most vulnerable. So, Madam Speaker, I'd be very careful with that language. That's probably inflaming a situation that doesn't need any further inflammation, I would say, Madam Speaker. Uh, these are issues that are on our shores. Uh, it's predominantly focused right now on the city of Charlottetown because of some of the issues and things that we've talked about today. Uh, the issue of uh, addiction and mental health challenges and homelessness is in our other city, in Summerside, Madam Speaker. Uh, we're seeing in places like Montague, in my hometown and area, where we're seeing these things that we have never seen before. And we're going to need collaboration from all across Prince Edward Island, from communities large and small, from NGOs, and from all parties in this House, Madam Speaker, to try to deal with this very complex and difficult issue that is hard on the heart of many islanders, many island families, Madam Speaker. And for the first time, for many people in this province, we're seeing it through our eyes on these shores for the first time. So I will continue to try to collaborate with everybody who wants to work, Madam Speaker, I will stand here every day until this House closes and then it reopens again and I'll answer every question that I can answer, Madam Speaker. But I tell you what, I'd be some happy to hear a bunch of solutions to come over here too, because I could use all the help we can get. Uh, end of question period. I'm just going to stand here, Honourable Members. Um, a few questions were over the time limit today, but almost all of the answers were. So I know you have lots of good news that you want to share, but please try and keep your answers to the 45 seconds and your questions to the 45 seconds. We're going to start this session on the right foot, and uh, <laughs> we're going to try to. <laughs> and uh, but if you can remember the time frame, uh, we've. I know we had a lot of uh, statements earlier today, but. Uh, if we could try and remember 45 seconds for questions and 45 seconds for answers. Thank you. Statements by ministers, presenting and receiving petitions, 
Tabling of documents. <clears throat> Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I beg leave of the House uh, to table Outreach Task Force Communications Plan for Government and the City of Charlottetown dated October the 26th, 2023. And I move second by a member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the said document be now received in due lie on the table. Chair Carey. Carey. Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter uh, concern from Ju Virtual Junior High Holman School regarding concerns in the area um, and actually plans and, and things that they want to hear uh, the government do uh, in the future to help, but th these need to be addressed. So when I, I do this, uh, the said document will be received and do lie on the table, and I second this by uh, O'Leary Inverness. Shall carry. <coughs> Reports by committees. Madam Speaker, please be advised that pursuant to Rule 80K of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, uh, this list of documents that were received by the Office of the Clerk and tabled intercessionally since the last House are presented to the House and will be included in the journal for today. So I'll carry. <clears throat> Introduction of government bills. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, uh, Sport and Culture. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be in Titchwold and act to amend the, amend the Archaeology Act, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Bill number 27, an act to amend the Archaeology Act, read a first time. <coughs> Honourable Member, an overview. Uh, Madam Speaker, these amendments are to transfer the administrative responsibilities of the Archaeology Act to the appropriate department now responsible for archaeology the Department of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, and these amendments will result in better alignment of activities under the Archaeology Act and reduce red tape for a more efficient and streamlined administrative process. <coughs> Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be in titled an act to amend the Agricultural Insurance Act, and I move seconded by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Bill number 25, an act to amend the Agriculture Insurance Act, read a first time. Member, an overview. These amendments will allow for livestock price insurance and allow the Agricultural Insurance Corporation Board the authority to appoint their choice of auditor to complete their year-end financial reports. Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be in Titchwold Adult Guardianship and Trustee Trusteeship Act, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, the same be now received and read a first time. Chair Carey. Bill number 19, Adult Guardianship and Trust Trusteeship Act, read a first time. Honourable <coughs> Minister. This, this act provides a statutory framework for adult guardianship and trusteeship in DEI. It provides for the appointment and authority of substitute decision makers who lack capacity to make certain decisions on their own behalf. Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be in titled the Public Guardian and Trustee Act, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Carry. Bill number 20, Public Guardian and Trustee Act, read a first time. Our Minister, an overview. This act, which replaces the Public Trustee Act, provides a legislative framework for the powers and duties of the Public Guardian and Trustee. Minister. Oh. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be in titled Powers of Attorney and Personal Directives Act, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Carry. Bill number 21, Powers of Attorney and Personal Directives Act, read a first time. An overview, Minister. This act, which replaces the Power Powers of Attorney Act, provides a statutory framework for powers of attorney and personal directives. It will allow Islanders to appoint other persons to make decisions on their behalf. Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be in Titchwold, an act to amend the Legal Profession Act, number two, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Carry. 
Bill number 22, an act to amend the Legal Profession Act number two, read a first time. An overview, Minister. This act amends the Legal Profession Act to implement changes recommended to government by the Law Society of Prince Edward Island. Minister. Uh, Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Police Act number two, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the same be now received and read a first time. <laughs> Shall carry. Carry. Bill number 30, an act to amend the Police Act number two, read a first time. Minister, an overview. This act amends the Police, Sta Police Act to specifically address the authority and powers related to the investigation of serious in incidents alleged to have been committed by police officers. It also enables the appointment of an acting police commissioner. <coughs> Honorable Minister. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the opi Opiate Damages and Health Care Costs Recovery Act, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 23, an act to amend the op Opioid Damages and Health Care Costs Recovery Act, read a first time. Minister, an overview. This act am amends the Opioid Damages and Health Care Costs Recovery Act to better align with recent changes to comparable legislation in other Canadian jurisdictions. Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled Government Reorganization Act, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Carry. Bill number 24, Government Reorganization Act, read a first time. Minister, an overview. This act updates the names of government departments and the titles of ministers and legislation to reflect the spring 2023 reorganization of government. Honorable Minister of Finance. Honorable oh. Minister of Health and Wellness. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled the Mental Health Act, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, the same be now received and read a first time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 28, Mental Health Act, read a first time. Minister, an overview. Madam Speaker, this bill will replace the existing Mental Health Act. It uh, updates existing definitions and adds new definitions. It provides that substantial physical or mental deterioration as an alternate to harm for Ill involuntary admission criteria. It also includes CTOs, a valuable treatment tool used in many provinces used to break the cycle of admission, improvement, decompensation, and readmission for patients who meet certain criteria and repeals redundant and dated provisions. Oh, Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an amendment to the Financial Administration Act, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Bill number 15, an act to amend the Financial Administration Act, read a first time. Honourable Minister, an overview. Thank you, Madam Speaker. An amendment to the Financial Administration Act would update the filing date for the public accounts to September 30th each and every year. This removes the different delivery dates depending upon if there is a fixed date, uh, fixed election date in a year. The former deadlines were on or before October 31st when a fixed general election is not to be held in the month of October and August 31st when there is a fixed general to be held in the month of October. This will allow consistency in publishing date and be better aligned with other jurisdictions across Canada. <coughs> Minister, do you have another bill? Yeah. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an amendment to the Financial Administration Act Number 2, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness, that the same be now received and read a first time. <coughs> Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 26, an act to amend the Financial Administration Act number two, read a first time. An overview, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. An amendment to the Financial Administration Act number two would update the language of the act, be more gender neutral, as well as update the department names and reporting entities in the schedules at the end of the act to reflect the most current names of departments and reporting entities. Our Minister of Finance. 
Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Liquor Control Act, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall I carry? Very Bill number 31, an act to amend the Liquor Control Act, read a first time. An overview, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. An act to amend the Liquor Control Act would modernize current re legislation and update the terms of manufacturing licenses for winery, microbrewery, and distilleries to allow products made on behalf of local manufacturers to be treated as if they were made at their manufacturing facility. This will bring PEI in line with other local other liquor jurisdictions and contract manufacturing. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intitled to child, the Child, Youth, and Family Services Act, and I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Housing, Land, and Communities that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall we carry? Carry, carry. Bill number 32, Child, Youth, and Family Services Act, read a first time. An overview, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Child and Youth Family Service Act updates and enhances the services provided by the Child Protection Act. This legislation will have a positive impact on all island families. The act will make the best interest of the child the main consideration for all persons acting or making decisions under the act. It will increase supports available to grandparents and other alternative care providers. It will expand eligibility to receive extended services for children and youth aging out of care from, age, from the age of 21 to 25, and it will decrease the length of time a child or youth can be in the care of the director or child protection, increasing the stability and permanency of a child's environment. Thank you. Honorable Minister, another bill? Yes, I do. Um, Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Adoption Act, and I moved, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Housing and Land and Communities, that the same be now received and read a first time. Bill Carey. Bill number 33, an act to amend the Adoption Act, read a first time. An overview, Minister. <clears throat> The act will align the current Adoption Act with the new Child, Youth, and Family Service Act. This includes some minor wording and process changes, as well <clears throat> as designating the Minister of Social Development and Seniors as Minister Responsible for the Act. Thank you. Thank Another you. bill, Minister? I do. I have one more. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg a leave to introduce a bill to, the, to be entitled an act to amend the Inter-Country Adoption Act, Hague uh, Convention <coughs> Act, and I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Housing and Landing Communities that the same be now received and read for a first time. Shall it carry? Bill number 34, an act to amend the Inter-Country Adoption Hague Convention Act, read a first time. An overview, Minister. Thank you. The act will align the current Inter-Country inter Adoption Hague Convention Act with the new Child, Youth, and Family Services Act. This includes, de includes designating the Minister of Social Development and Seniors as the minister responsible for this act. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Another bill? Minister of Housing, Land, and Communities. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Amusement Devices Act, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall it carry? Very good. Bill number 29, an act to amend the Amusement Devices Act, read a first time. Minister, an overview, please. The purpose of this act is to update the definition of amusement device to better align with language used in the codes adopted in the regulations. It also includes a change in regulation making powers to allow adoption of any code, rule, or standard related to amusement devices beyond those recognized by the Standards Council of Canada and updates language related to safety inspections. Honorable Minister Housing, have another bill? I do. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Municipal, Go Municipal Government Act. And I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors, that the same be now received and read a first time. 
Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 37, an act to amend the Municipal Government Act, read a first time. Minister, an overview. This act will amend the Municipal Government Act to clarify and support portions of the Code of Conduct regulations, which were introduced in April 2023. It will also remove mandatory planning requirements for some municipalities in preparation for the upcoming land use plan. Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be entitled an act to amend the Off-Highway Vehicle Act, and I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance that the same be now received and read a first time. Chair Carey. Bill number 35, an act to amend the Off-Highway Vehicle Act, read a first time. Minister, an overview. Madam Speaker, this amendment will align the Off-Highway Vehicle Act with changes made to the Trails Act to clarify appropriate use of the trail under the Act and regulations. This amendment, Madam Speaker, also provides for license plates assigned to specific off-highway vehicles to remain with the off-highway vehicle when that vehicle is sold or transferred on Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Minister. Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, and I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall it carry? Here. Bill number 36, an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, read a first time. An overview, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This bill will amend the collateral benefit provision contained in subsection 42.2 of the Workers' <coughs> Compensation Act from excess of 85% to excess of 90% and will bring this subsection into alignment with the rest of the wage laws provisions in the Act. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Government motions, orders of the day government. The Honorable Minister of Fisheries, <coughs> Tourism, uh, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm seeking the second reading of Bill Number 28, the Mental Health Act, which was introduced and read a first time today. Does the member have unanimous consent? Yes. yes. There is not unanimous consent, Honorable Member. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the second order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Okay. Order Number Two, an Act to amend the Health Information Act, Bill Number Three, ordered for second reading. Shall I carry? Carry. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall I carry? Carry. Bill number three, an act to amend the Health Information Act, read a second time. Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall I carry? Deputy Speaker, if you could come and chair committee the whole.
The House is now a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Health Information Act. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Shall it carry? Carry. See the capital budget. Nicola, could you introduce yourself and your title for Hansard? Hi, I'm Nicola Hewitt, Solicitor Legislative Specialist of the Department of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Uh, is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause? Hold it off. Open it up for questions. <laughs> Minister, do you have any opening comments? Hi. Nicola? Um, this isn't the. Th this uh, bill is uh, basically a housekeeping bill that's been brought about as a result of some minor issues identified by the Office of Information and Privacy Commissioner, Health PEI, and the Department of Health and Wellness. Um, just so everybody knows, um, we have consulted with the biggest custodian in the province and with the Office of Information and Privacy Commissioner, and they have signed off on the amendments. They support them. Are there any questions on the bill? Chair. Sure. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Hi, Nicola. Nice to see you, Minister. Thank you. Um, just a couple of, of questions on that. You've explained what the purpose of, of this bill is and what prompted it coming forward, and that you've spoken to the Privacy Commissioner are two of my, my questions. Um, there's just some specific things on the bill. In the, the very first section, Section 1A, um, in subclause E, Two, by the addition of the words, when not acting as an agent or employee of a custodian. And I'm just wondering why does it make a difference if a healthcare provider is acting as an agent or an employee of a custodian, just for my own understanding. So when, for example, if it's a dentist in private practice, they would be deemed to be a custodian and they have all the responsibilities imposed on them. However, if you're a dentist and an employee of Health PEI, Health PEI would be the custodian. So that's how that's intended to work. So you don't want every health care provider in Health PEI maintaining their own separate set of records. So that's what that's intended to fix. I understand. And New I Haven, Rocky Point. And I appreciate the example. There you Nicola. go. <laughs> Section EV, which is the next one, um, removes information managers. And what, what what's an information manager? Or maybe that's... Yeah. Explained somewhere. It is it? in section 42 of the Act. Oh. An information manager is, I guess, for those here, um, we're all probably familiar with ITSS. They're the ones who manage our information. So 42 is, um, sorry, an information manager is a person or organization that, on behalf of a custodian, uh, processes, stores, retrieves, archives, or disposes of personal health information, de-identifies or otherwise transforms it, or provides information management or information technology service. So they're not actually a custodian. They're a manager. Understand. They're required to enter into an agreement with a custodian and required to abide by the Act. Okay. Okay. New you. Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you again, Chair. Uh, Section 21. Um, Sub one, deletion of the words uh, or from another person in accordance right. with section 18. Can you explain why people wouldn't be informed and yeah. how their information yeah. is being used? So this was actually a request that came forward from the Privacy Commissioner's okay. Office, okay, um, and it follows um, in, in lines with uh, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick. So the individuals. Um, when you collect personal health information directly from an individual, you give them the information. But when you collect it under Section 18 of the Act, um, you don't have to abide by the same kind of requirements. So it's it's you know it's it's information that may be um, from another from another individual. Um, so for example, if you are the specialists. Um, office and you're trying to collect information from the primary care provider, you don't need to get the patient's direct consent because they've already consented to the referral kind of thing. Got it. Okay. 
Thank you. New Chair. Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Section 22.5, sub H, removes uh, a custodian may use personal information in its custody or under the control for the purpose of disposing of the personal health information or de-identifying yep. the personal health information. Is that removed because it's redundant? Um, yeah. So yeah. If you look up at, uh, in the Act, um, subclause 5 says a custodian may use personal health information. So when you go down to H, you don't need to use personal health information the, for the purpose of disposing of it. So that's why that part is inappropriate. It's, uh -huh. it's redundant. Uh -huh. And then we've got or de-identifying the personal health information. That's already repeated in Clause R. So that's why H is completely redundant. New Haven, Rocky okay. Point. Okay, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that explanation, Nicola. Um, Section 23, sub 11C added designations in the regulations, and can you, can you explain that change? I wasn't sure what that meant. Oh, yes. This was another issue raised by the, um, the Office of Privacy Commissioner. So what this is, is a requires custodians to disclose PHI without consent. Um, and what we've got right now is to a custodian who compiles or maintains a registry of PHI for the purpose of facilitating or improving health care. And one of the concerns uh, that the Privacy Commissioner's Office expressed, uh, and they used the term rogue custodians. So they just, they want to be able to limit under whom that information can be disclosed under that provision. So if you're not listed in the regulations, it will not be disclosed. Okay, interesting. Is, mm -hmm. it, is, is that a real you thing? Uh, uh, the, uh, Again, they use the term rogue custodians, okay. so they must be familiar with something that's come forward. Okay. Yeah. Rogue custodians. Rogue Thank you for that. Custodians. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming a, a, many of these changes have been prompted because of the move to electronic yeah. health records. So I can speak to that next That'd set That would be of, great. Yeah. So I don't know how many of you were in here way back when, when we originally brought the Act into play, but it was really, so that was in 2014, so it was a lot of crystal ball gazing on my part and uh, just taking a you know, best guess at, at what we might need. And the way this is, um, Section 7 is set up, or, or sorry, Part 7 of the Act mm -hmm. is set up, the EHR, is it places the emphasis, a lot of emphasis on the custodian for setting up the system and putting the checks and balances in place. Well, as the system has evolved, it's actually the minister who has set up the system. So the onus shouldn't be on the custodians to make sure the checks and balances are there. The onus needs to be on the minister. And that's what these changes do. It switches the onus. So we're not taking anything away, we're not adding anything, but we're putting the onus on the minister. So for example, when somebody accesses the EHR to look at um, Charlottetown and West Royalty's PHI, there is an electronic record, so the ministry has set up, um, that there will be a track and a record of who's accessed it and the type of information that was accessed. So that onus is now on the minister and not on the individual custodians. And that's what those are all designed to address. I yeah. appreciate that very clear explanation, again. My um, fault. <laughs> A couple of other things in Section 7, really not, not much. You've sort of explained yep. uh, the, the, at a high level what's going on here. And we've seen that the EHR has not done what it was um, always intended to do, the um, gynecological <coughs> referrals, for example. So what if the system itself loses records, doesn't retain <coughs> records as we anticipate it will? I can't speak to that. I mean, that's that would you'd have to speak to the system designers and developers. I would imagine there are redundancies built in, but that's pure speculation on my part. Yeah. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. So, I mean, I guess my only concern is should we in this in, in this sort of interim period, if I can put it that way, while EHR is being adopted and uh, spreads through the system, if we're if we're not completely confident of the stability and the ability of the system to do what we hope it, it will, should we, is there a provision in the legislation, I don't believe there is, for us to maintain both record keeping functions, a hard copy and um, an electronic copy? 
there isn't a requirement that both be kept, but the legislation certainly contemplates that both can be kept. Okay. New Haven or Occupy? Okay. I'm out. I, yeah. It, our dependence on uh, on technology, and I, 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 I make this comment largely based on the fact that the EHR has been problematic. I don't think anybody here would would argue with that statement. And if we're going to move entirely to uh, rely on the system that we have to maintain good PHI records, then we we may be opening ourselves up to loss of records and, and how and PHI records are among the most critical and most sensitive um, and not just loss of them but if, we, if we're not completely confident in the system and we're using a system which is not used elsewhere um, and that, that's why I, I'm, I'm asking these questions. So I guess one of the safeguards I would think are in place is every time we there is a phase or any, any new collection use or disclosure of information um, is built into the system. There's a requirement that a, an assessment be um, submitted to the Privacy Commissioner's office. So I would assume that they're looking at it through that type of a lens too, what kind of redundancies, what kind of safety mechanisms are, are put in there. But again, that's, you know, again, speculative on my part. But there is that, it's not just the ministry going ahead and, and building this system. There, there is some oversight along the way. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can tell you where. Bear with me for a second, I'll tell you where that for is. Sure. You've got me flipping through my, my act now. So privacy impacts assessments are on section 25 of the act. So they um, prepare a privacy impact assessment and sub it, submit it to the cust uh, commissioner for review and comment for the new collection use or disclosure of PHI or any significant change to uh, use collection or disclosure. The creation of a personal health information system or pers personal health information communication technology or a significant modification to personal health information system or personal health information communication technology. And I've seen some of these submissions. They're mm -hmm. like that thick. Um, yeah. So I think they're given a fairly rigorous going over by the Privacy Commissioner's office. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Chair. Or New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, just a couple more, Chair. Thanks. Uh, this is Section 712 I'm talking about here, um, prohibition or disclosure by authorized custodians. And uh, I'm wondering currently who other than a custodian could collect and use personal health information um, in the PEI electronic health record system? Who, if anybody? Well, other than uh, legally, probably nobody. <laughs> Right. Um, we do have a, a list in the regulations of who is an authorized custodian. Mm -hmm. In the uh, bear with me. Uh, authorized custodians under Part Seven of the Act are healthcare facilities, healthcare providers, and health PEI. All right. And then healthcare facilities and healthcare providers are defined terms in the Act. And. They include a hospital, health center, medical center, dental clinic, optometry clinic, physiotherapy clinic, a pharmacy, and any other facility in which health care is provided that's designated in the regulations. So there may be more in there. And a health care provider is a person who is registered or licensed to provide health care under an enactment or who is a member of a class or persons designated as health care providers in the regulations. And I believe that includes social workers. Okay. Okay. New Haven, I'm Rocky good. Point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nicole. Okay. Shall the bill carry? I move the title. An act to amend the Health Information Act. Shall I carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. 
be enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall I carry? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report that the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall I carry? Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Health Information Act, I beg to leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to the same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall carry. Carry. Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that the seventh order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Here. Order number seven, an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act, Bill number 12, in committee. Madam <coughs> Minister? Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall I carry? Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair committee of the whole. The House is now a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall I carry? Here. Welcome. Could you introduce yourself for answers? Yes, uh, Greg Wilson. Acting Director of the Environment Regulatory Division of the Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Change Action. Thank you, Greg. Um, <coughs> members, we are in debate on this bill uh, from the previous session. Uh, I have exhausted my list. Would anybody like to be added to my list? Uh, the member for O'Leary Inverness. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, when we talked about this, uh, piece of legislation that changing, I mean, you, you've you come up with this change in a basically you're increasing the fines of violations uh, contrary to the environmental protection. How, why was 50,000 picked as the, I mean, it's a, an increase, quite a substantial increase from 10,000 to 50. So wh why was that number the number that was determined as the appropriate number for the legislation? Well, I can give you from the, from my lens was that we, <coughs> we were dealing with a number of issues, one in particular, where um, the fine didn't matter to the person. They were determined to do whatever they wanted to do and they, they didn't care about the fines. So it was $10,000 to just pay it and call it part of the construction project and 
and not care. So we want it to be a significant enough amount that when we're dealing with somebody who's being who who uh, is flagrantly dis ignoring our rules, that we can get them back into line somehow. O'Leary Inverness. From what I would assess on that particular case that you're trying to deal with, that uh, I would argue that 50,000 wouldn't make much of a difference for that, that person situation. <laughs> and where I'm kind of coming from is the unintended consequences of what would be impacted by, I'll say, small farmers, forestry operators, and things like that that could be in a similar circumstance. And uh, that, that's where I'm sort of coming from. So I, I really would like better background to why 50,000. You know, like I said, if you're really trying to get the high end uh, shoreline protection violator, you know, it, in the situation we're talking, I doubt 50 would make much of a difference. Okay, right here. So, so is there any, uh, as the chair's a question, so is there any compromise to a smaller fine so that we're not impacting the, I know it's an up to, but. I guess just to speak to your question, so we did a review <clears throat> in the Maritimes, and both Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have maximums for individuals of 50,000. So we're trying to line up with okay. the maritime region there to make sure we're all in the same same boat. So that's that's how 50,000 was derived. O'Leary and Burness. Okay. Well, that that's at least an explanation, and I and I appreciate that, and that gives <coughs> some uh, reasoning uh, behind that that number. Uh, one of, one of the, like I had, have you had much consultation with some of the agricultural organizations as well as forestry groups on this? Well, there, there hasn't been, we talked to the, like the current Minister of Agriculture, it was kind of a co-bill that we had promised we'd take forward in response to some of the things that were going, going on, but we don't feel like that's where our issues are with agriculture and forestry, but that, that's not really who the target would be in this case. Like, mm. And the, the the fines are two hundred to fifty thousand dollars. So because it's fifty thousand dollars I mean I think that quite often you would see fines less than what the top line is. I mean I'm not in enforcement but um, yeah. I think that, Greg, we, yeah, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, it, it's quite common that once they go to court that those fines, it's, it's, it's very rare that you go to that maximum fine. You have to have a certain set of circumstances where, I'll give you an example, maybe where the enforcement officers tried to work with the owner or tried to work with the person who called the disturbance. They've gone and said, what can we do? Can we make this better? And got belligerence or got you know, told to go, yeah. you know, so it's like trying to work it. That, that helps feed into it as well, is it, with that <coughs> so You don't often get that max fine when you go. O'Leary Inverness? Yeah, and no, and I, I appreciate that and I understand that, but as a legislator, we are, we are given the authority to ever who, the, it's not us that determines the fine, it's going to be the court, right? And that's probably a judge. And, uh, you know, when, so when we're allowing them to go to the, the 50 to 200, it then becomes what, what were the intentions here? And, and I know it's great for the minister to say that you're really not going after the foresters and you're really not going after farmers on this, but that's the unintended consequences of when we put the fine up to that, that amount. W wouldn't probably make much of a difference to a, you know, a developer that's doing a big shoreline protection situation, 50,000, but it would probably put a farmer out of, out of business or put, put a small forestry operator out of business. And, uh, you know, I, I have had, I won't say consultations with the industry, but I have contacted a number of the foresters in my area, and uh, they, they find that that would be a significant issue if it was 50,000. And once again, we can't determine what the number is. That's going to be up to a judge to determine. So, and, and the big issue that I've found with, with the foresters, and I see this on myself, whether it comes to buffer zones, we have, a, we have maps that sort of determine this, but on the ground, it's a pretty near impossible to determine what's a wetland and what's not a wetland, where a buffer, loan starts and a buffer zone starts and ends, and that's where I sort of feel that for some of these smaller operators, you're, you're putting them up into a number that possibly could basically put them out of business for maybe something that wasn't that significant. So, so I just... Uh, have, that's where my concerns are, and it doesn't sound like there was really a lot of consultation on this. And 
but I, I'd be interested with you, Greg, and I've worked with you, Greg, and I have a lot of, of uh, respect for you <laughs> in, uh, in the work that you and do. me as well. Oh, and you too, <laughs> Minister. I, I should, I should uh, admit, admit at you in, the, in giving some credit. But are you finding that you, you, it, it is hard to determine? I, I would almost argue if I was to ask where a buffer zone starts and ends, if I got 10 people out, even from your own department, they would have a different line in the sand. And I'd say the same thing goes when it comes to a wetland on cutting trees. I, I mean, I talked to the forestry contractor trying to clean up some of my land from Fiona, and he said, you, you can't tell. You know, there's, there's spots that you know are wet and there's some that aren't, but then there's all this area in between that you're not so sure. And that's where I go back to cutting some trees in a spot that may, even though it may be a smaller fine than 50,000, it could be a heck of a lot more than 10. And, and that's where I'm just kind of concerned of the unintended consequences of this. <coughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'd be curious to your opinion on how accurate all these maps and wetlands and buffer zone lines are actually that it's so easy to determine in real life on the ground. So give, well, me, some, give me some feedback. Before, just before, Greg, I, I do, and maybe Greg can elaborate on this because I know he's got a very difficult job and that <laughs> that whole group is a very very difficult job and they're dealing with people and telling them things that they don't necessarily want to hear all of, all the time <clears throat> but what i will say is my understanding is we we will always work with land landowners or, or operators it, it it doesn't necessarily go right to charges and even at that even if greg's shop d discovers something and feels like there should be charges it goes over to justice to for charges so that there still not be, may not be charges come come out of it, so I would think that, and and maybe you're you're much better to speak at this than, than I am, but I think we're very very fair with anybody that we deal with that they're doing things that could be accidental. I'm, is that fair, Greg? Yeah, um, just to elaborate on that yeah. for you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> like over the last number of years, too, to put your mind at ease, the forestry operations and the farming community, they haven't been major issues for us mm. with violations, right? I think the word is getting out to the public about what what's, can go and what can't go. And those two groups are one of our, are two of our better groups. So it doesn't concern right. me that much that way, right? Um, as far as what, how difficult it is to identify, the maps are fairly accurate, but we do not make a charge. We do not go to court unless a person goes to the site and does that evaluation on the site. That's stop. Mm -hmm. So those people are trained, they have trained to determine whether it is based on certain <coughs> criteria. Only then, and only then after speaking with the group, with the department, do we decide, is this one warranted? Do we need to do this? Are there any external circumstances? Did the guy get a permit, but it was he did, forgot to renew it? Was it something he made a phone call and someone in the department picked it up and forgot to relay that? All that gets looked at before you would move towards a charge. Mm -hmm. And then, as the minister had said, um, we work with justice because we just go to the site and say, here's what we recommend. Their justice and public safety enforcement officers actually lay that charge, talk to the Crown, and then make that determination to go forward. So. Uh, well, there you invest one more, and I can put you sure. back on the list. Yeah, yeah no, I, and I, I appreciate that too. I, like I said, and I, I understand that you're going to be relatively trying to be fair, but that's not what the legislation is about being fair. It's about whether the fines are going to be, right? And uh, I, I just kind of go back to saying, <laughs> like you say that the, the maps are fairly accurate. Well, that's not black and white, you know, and I'll say they are probably fairly accurate, but they're not bang on in every circumstance. I said many times, my own land, I've got land that's not designated wetland, and I can guarantee you it is wet, and then I've got land that's designated wetland, and I can guarantee you it's not wet. Now, is it the whole area or a whole map? No, but, it, you know, I'm just saying it's, it's not as easy to determine on the ground and uh, yes, I'm sure your officers would be more than fair and try to work things out with everybody. And I, I've been a minister and I try to, and always said to my staff to you know, work with people. And if they are belligerent, that's a different story. But let's try to work things out and to the best of your ability. Yeah. So that's all I, my concerns are just where the unintended consequences of what we're dealing with. And uh, we don't specifically say it's for shoreline protection, we're, it, it's just an Environmental Protection Act amendment. So. <coughs> Farmers and foresters, although not the, the uh, intended target here, could be. That, that, that's where my issue tends to be, and a $50,000 fine, although you at least have some background to why the number is 50. I just think it's a high number uh, for some of those. So for that reason, I'll have a hard time supporting this bill. But anyway, I thank you, Chair, for the ability to ask questions. Yeah, and yeah. if Greg wants to add their yeah, comments, I mean, that, I'd that's I'd like fine. to add, and Greg, I'd like to add, I'd just like to say that, that this is a, 
This clause was a 1988 clause, so I would, I would argue that $10,000 in 1988 was much more than $50,000 in 2023. So we're, we're trying to make it so that it has the, at least the same impact it would have had in 88, if not more. So that's all. Just the other thing to add to that, too, is that our department, we put out the word that please call us. If you're not sure and you're a forestry operation, we will move mountains to make sure we get there. If you call us and say, I don't want to do this, I'm not sure what it is, could you please come help me? That's what the staff are for. So we will go to them <coughs> instead of, ah, I'm not sure, I'm just going to go on my own and see what happens here or whatever. That's where we run into troubles. So if we can all get there, we will do that ahead of time so none of this happens in the first place. I don't appreciate you wanting to do that. I don't want to say okay. uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciated your answers, especially to the last bit about the inflationary value of $10,000 from 30 years ago. And I'll start there, Greg, because you, you mentioned that the rationale for setting it at 50000 was that it's in line with the other Atlantic provinces. This is 32.1, which refers to natural persons, but 32.3 refers to corporations. Are we in the same, this is just for my own information, when we come to the fines for corporations, which are now exactly the same as natural persons with this amendment here on PEI, is that true in the other Atlantic provinces as well? Yeah, we, f we find the corporation level that we have now is probably a little bit less than what the other maritime provinces have. So a little bit low there, but we, this would bring us up to similar with persons, yeah. individuals. Sure. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, that doesn't surprise, I don't know, but I, that answer doesn't surprise me, Greg. And uh, when you look at the concentration of wealth of, since 1988, the minister, uh, I, I completely agree with him that $50,000 now is probably equivalent, I mean, I don't know, but, it, you know, it's a, it's a fair argument anyway that $10,000 today is not what it was in 1988. <coughs> um, why did we not also, because to my mind, the, the folks who, and, and, uh, my colleague here mentioned that for some folks, 50000 is not a lot of money. Uh, for almost any corporation, no, it's certainly large ones, 50000 is nothing whatsoever. So why did we not increase the maximum fine for corporations while we were doing it for individuals? I don't know if you want to tackle it, I don't know. I guess when we looked at that and said, well, we're a little bit low, but we're comparable, we didn't feel the need at that time, and it wasn't asked to go down that road, so we did not. New Haven, Rocky Point. Because certainly uh, people will, uh, individuals will um, have the potential to violate the EPA, of course. Um, but often uh, folks will have a corporation which they, you know, they may own the property, they may be the ones who are doing the development through their corporation. So this really doesn't in any way uh, create a uh, disincentive to those folks, as, as um, my colleague said earlier, to, to do anything about that. I'm, I, I'm wondering, would you consider an amendment to the bill to include uh, also uh, an increase for corporations? And uh, if you could get some sense of where we are with Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and, and do that today and, and increase that similarly. Oh, okay. Well, like I'm okay with that. New Haven, Rocky Point. Is that in order? I don't know. It's a different clause that we're not dealing it's with. It's a different I'm clause. It would be a different, yeah. a different I think amendment. It would be different to. It would. Yes, I don't, I don't have anything prepared now. I, no. Um, I think it might have to be. You're not a amending separate. the amendment, right? No, <coughs> not, you're, you're no, no. I'm in favor a, of this. A separate absolutely. amendment at a different time. Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, you're right. I, and it, but one of the things that we'll say is when I, you know, when I was thinking of corporations, I think of the people that are doing it, so I never really thought of a shell company designed to do it and walk away. So it's a good point. I mean, we've basically said contractors would just take your license away, right. which will, which really makes the contractors come into line. But if you set, set up a shell company to <coughs> do it, I mean, and, and let's face it, some of these people have enough money to do that easily. That's a good point. I, we'll go back and do that. Okay. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. And I know we talked about this in the spring, and I remember you being very patient, Greg, waiting to get on the floor many, many times. It was less of a wait today, and I appreciate that. Um, and I, I don't know if I asked this question or not, but um, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but how many prosecutions do we have through the, the, in this clause um, every year, approximately? Yeah, I'm, 
again, they're kept with enforcement. Like we, we work with them, but those actual numbers are kept with justice and public safety or whatever. But are, which type of, are you referring to? Which type of violation? Well, this is, if I remember, I, I don't have the bill EPA in front of me, but, the, but it's any violation of this act, I think. So any of the provisions of the act, if it's violated, it will be captured under 32.1. So yeah. do you have any sense of how many, just even a ballpark figure, Greg? Mm, again, I, I'm really going out here, but uh, I'd say anywhere between 50 to 100, maybe. But I mean, you're looking at $200 fines, too, and that's right. There's a right. Whole, whole range. If you're asking how many, like, <coughs> the $10,000 previous fines would we have, very small amount. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that was going to be my next question, Greg. So you, you, you don't know how many actually hit that upper level? Not <coughs> with me today, no. Okay. I can take that back, though. If you want. I'll Thank you. I'm, I'm good, Chair. Thanks. Uh, Board and Concora. Thanks, Chair. I think we all know what this act is a result of. Um, and I feel sorry for Robbie Moore and, and that oyster company and how they were affected by this. Was there any thought in being added into this, this changed compensation or some way that, and i got to be honest with you, in, in, in my opinion, I don't think Robbie Moore's op oyster operation was was looked at as seriously as it was affected. And I'm sort of wondering, was there any thought put into of, of maybe compensating or building in compensation to the actual fisher, or the harvester, or the processor to, to help mediate what he had to go through? I mean, it's a good point. I don't know how you would put that into the, this legal structure, but I would agree that he was, that he, he had effects that were directly to his business that were negative because of this. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I looked at a number of times myself. Board Kikora. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I appreciate that, Minister. I know you worked very hard on that. I know that uh, the Honorable Member from uh, that riding, Minister of Agriculture, also was, was quite involved in it. So, so was I at the time. What's your thoughts on the, and you alluded to the fact that you can take the license away from the contractor. But are we actually dealing with that, con that contractor severely enough, or, or should we make sure that there's something in the act that could possibly come at a further change, that you go into somebody's property and you do something against the environment, then you're going to lose your equipment? <coughs> I don't know if that's a good question. I don't, that's, you're into the legal part of it, I don't know. If, if he's a contractor, he most likely fall into the corporation's side. So he'd be in that higher fine regime, right? So you're not in the 50000 anymore. You're probably in the 100000 or more, right? So it can be significant for them because that's what they are. Okay. Board and Kikora? One other point, uh, two, uh, two more points, Chair. The, the next point is I read the orders issued by DFO. <coughs> and in my opinion, and from what I've read and saw, I almost wonder, did the department follow the direction of DFO and what DFO ordered that could be allowed to do? Because in my opinion, I don't think the, and I'm going to say it, I don't think the Department of the Environment followed what the DFO order, DFO order was. Can you comment on that? What the order was, do you? Yeah, I can comment on that. So they, the DFO order was directed at that person, <coughs> the landowner, to do that work. We were watching that or whatever else that was required, but there was nothing we followed, okay. whatever they wanted us to do, but they didn't direct it at us. They directed okay. it at that adjacent landowner that possibly had that effect. So. Okay. Appreciate that. Final point, Chair. Or in Kinkora. I, I, I've had a experience, we'll call it, in law enforcement invest, in, in investigations over a number of years. I'd like to make amendment, Chair, that the $200 be raised to $1,000. Substitute the $200 for $1,000, and the reason being is this. You drive through a speed sign today, you cough for speed, and you go through a stop sign, you get a $200 fine. We're talking about the environment. We should be doing everything we can to protect the environment and make sure these acts do not happen. I would ask that we amend the $200 to $1,000. And no, I do not have copies of this. No can I just make a point? Uh, yes, you can, yeah. yeah. Just, just to keep in mind that if you change that minimum or whatever, so then the 75-year-old lady 
who's on her woodlot and cuts down a tree that she didn't get anything for, it removes that piece from the officer discretion about, oh, now I got to give you a thousand dollar minimum instead of the two hundred. So, just be careful what where you go with it. There's there's always other circumstances that might come into that you don't think of right now. That's all. Well, I'm very familiar with that. Concora. I'm very familiar with that because in case law, and we we deal with minimum and maximums. More than likely, 99.9% .9 of the time, there will always be the minimum fine that's issued. And if it does go to court, then the judge will look at the case law or previous precedents as it was established by previous offenses. So a $200 fine can be set for a lot of different things for a long time period for a lot of different circumstances and end up being the minimum and the standard that will always be given. You, that's perfectly right. The most that's of the time, if it's right. left long enough, the minimum exactly. becomes the standard. Chair, I'd like to ask for an amendment that the, the $200 be raised to $1,000. All right, honorable member, uh, we'll take a recess to get that uh, typed up, and uh, then you can uh, put that forward.
All right, members, we're uh, back now. Uh, the pages are handing out the amendment. Can I get a copy of that? Can I get a copy of that first? Sorry. <laughs> Take cords. So the member for Borg Kinkora is moving the following amendment to replace $200 with $1,000 in Section 1 of Bill 12. <coughs> Members, we are now debating the uh, amendment to the amendment, the amended amendment. Uh, is there anybody that would like to discuss that? Uh, O'Leary and Burness. Yeah, I guess from my perspective, I, I just find that I was trying to do the opposite, trying to get the fines down a bit. You're putting them up. <laughs> Going after, after the small farmers and forestry people and seniors, which seems very in, uh, not indicative of your uh, style of politics there, member, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, so I, I have a hard time with, with this, and uh, I can't support the, the amendment uh, to uh, move forward. So, All right. thank you, so, member. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, in our previous discussions, uh, Greg and I were chatting, and he said, uh, you know, there's a lot of $200 fines in there. And I guess my concern is, if uh, <coughs> do you think that there might be a hesitance for folks to prosecute if the if the minimum fine sort of seems out of line or excessive related to the conduct that may have been may have occurred all I can comment on there is my speaking with the enforcement group and they and they pr prefer to have that lower fine so they can have some flexibility when they run into incidents that weren't egregious or whatever else and they want those heavier fines for those ones but they often run into things where oh I, I drove into that stream I didn't know it was there right. I cut right. those trees I didn't know where where the buffer zone was like it gives them an opportunity to, instead of, well, sorry, here's $1,000, it's like, you learned your lesson, it's $200 fine, and move on, sort of deal. Member, uh, uh, New Haven Rocky Point is the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Greg, I know I've, you probably don't know the answer to this, but uh, I asked earlier what number of maximum fines are there. Maybe I'll put the question slightly broader. Are a lot of the fines that are prosecuted or that come under this section, would they be the, at the minimum level? A majority of them would be. Majority. Yeah. Okay. And you would prefer to, sorry, Chair. New Haven, Rocky Point. And you would prefer to maintain it at $200? I wouldn't prefer, but I, when talking You're, with the enforcement group, I've heard them say that, that they like a minimum to have some flexibility. Okay. Thank you. I'm good, Chair. Uh, Board and Concora. There's nothing that says a conservation officer or a police officer or a law enforcement officer has to give a fine. The discretion is always there. You can find somebody doing something. You can get a complaint. You can investigate it. You can attend, and you can say, "Listen, you shouldn't have drove into the field because or into the into the into the into the brook because you didn't know it was there. You shouldn't have cut that tree down because it's in the buffer zone." Here's a warning, a written warning under some, under under the acts, which is allowed and you have a good day. I'm thinking about the individual that blatantly goes into a wetland or into a buffer zone and cuts down a large volume or whatever the volume is that's beyond the, the lady or the person, the landowner, that by mistake cuts a tree or there's a storm and removes a tree from a brook. That, I think, is a different. That's where we have officers in the province to make the decisions and say, you know what, this is a warning. You shouldn't, and, 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 and you call it a day. Would you agree with that, Greg? I'll speak to that. Just There is another opportunity there, because if I get this right, they can do, use a long information, they call it, and they can leave it open and let the judge decide what that That's right. would be. There's all kinds of options. All right, members, I've exhausted my list. Uh, I'm now going to call for a vote uh, on the amendment to the amendment. So shall the amendment to the amendment carry? Yes. No. So I'm going to show a hands. Members, all those voting for the amendment to the amendment, raise your hand. You got that? All right. <laughs> all those voting against the amendment to the amendment. Members, the uh, amendment to the amendment has uh, <coughs> did not pass. We will now go back to debating uh, the original amendment. I have exhausted my list, members. Shall the uh, amendment carry? 
Uh, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Those voting uh, in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. This is the bill. 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 Those voting in for the bill. Those voting against the bill. The bill has carried. Just the sorry, the bill has passed. Just bill. the liberals against. And an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to the same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Recorded division has been requested. <coughs> Deputy Sergeant Arms. You ring the bell. <clears throat> Honourable members, all of those voting against the report of the committee, please stand. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness, and the Honourable Member from Borden Kinkora. Honourable members, all of those in favour of the report to the committee, please stand. The Honourable Minister of Finance, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Malpac, the Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, the Honourable Minister of Tourism, Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Honourable Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, the Honourable Minister of Social Development and, ha and Seniors, the Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, the Honourable Minister of Economic Development and Innovation and Trade, the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness, the Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot, the Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald, 
the Honorable Member from Surrey Elmira, the Honorable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, the Honorable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, and the Honorable Member from Morel Dona. Honorable Members, the bill has passed. Honorable uh, Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that the third order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order number three, an act to amend the Police Act, Bill Number 7, ordered for second reading. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill Number 7, an act to amend the Police Act, read a second time. Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take, in, take into consideration the said bill. Deputy Speaker, please chair committee of the whole. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be attituled an act to amend the Police Act. Minister, would like to uh, make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, yes Shall I carry? Carry. Blair, can you introduce yourself for answers? Yes, Blair Barber, Legislative Specialist for the Department of Justice and Public Safety. Minister, do you have any opening comments? Uh, or no, I actually should actually ask if it's the pleasure of the committee that the bill now be read now read clause by clause. Open it up. Open it up, and first I will say, Minister, do you have any opening comments, or just go right into questions? We can go right into questions. All right. I want to hear your on it. <laughs> <laughs> Shall the bill carry? Carry. Oh. Okay. No. New Haven, Sorry. Rocky Point. Yeah, just a couple of very short questions here. Thank you, Minister, for being here. No problem. I will, I will direct my questions to Blair. Well, uh, Blair. <laughs> <laughs> Blair, what was the feedback that we got from UPEI? I know you consulted with QPI and UPEI, but what did they say? Uh, what I saw, there, there was a letter basically uh, in favour of the amendment. Uh, and noting the, the agreement of QP as well to the, the amendment to uh, remove the police status of security police under the Police Act. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. Did, did the province get any feedback from the police commissioner on the act, or was it not necessary to speak with him? Not, in, not on this particular amendment, no. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Um, so what do you think the practical impact of this change will be on your PEI? Are they going to, you know, are they going to, contract services elsewhere? Did you speak to them about that? I'm just wondering what, what will change in practical terms. Uh, we didn't speak to them specifically about that. That's an internal matter to yep. the PEI. I would speculate that they will provide for security in some way or other. Yeah. New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, last question, Chair. Thanks. Are there, uh, the midpoint review, uh, uh, midpoint evaluation of the police review, uh, had many recommendations. This is only one of them. Are there any sort of any further legislative changes that we should expect from the midpoint evaluation? 
I, I think the answer is eventually. So our our group uh, of uh, staff at JPS is currently working on those recommendations. A lot of those recommendations currently that they're looking at are on police standards, many of which are under the regulations. So they're working on those, but I, I think in in time you will see further uh, legislative changes um, related to those recommendations in the review. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm good. Shall the bill carry? Carry. carry. I move the title. Sorry. An act to amend the Police Act. I move the enact. Oh. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor of the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall I carry? Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Police Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to the same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Sure. <clears throat> Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to introduce the bill to be entitled an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, and I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. carry. Bill number 106, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, read a first time. Honourable Member, do you have an overview? Sorry, thank you, Madam Speaker. So basically, um, it's regarding paid sick days and there is clauses in it for temporary um, financial support to businesses uh, to change over to uh, the five, six days that are recommended in this uh, amendment. Thank you. <clears throat> Honorable member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intentional Ukrainian Famine and Genocide Holodomor Memorial Day Act. And I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the same be now received and read a first time. So I'll carry. Bill number 105, Ukrainian Famine and Genocide Holodomor Memorial Day Act. Read a first time. <coughs> Member, an overview? Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. This is to um, you know, talk about a, a famine um, in, in Ukraine in 1932-33. It's important to our uh, new uh, Ukrainian communities. Um, that, that we, we look at this and, and solidify this in our, in our books here because it was a travesty and I will talk further about that when I bring the bill forward. <clears throat> Thank you, Member. <clears throat> member from Charlottetown West Royalty. I'm seeking unanimous consent that motion number 63, calling on government to release a community outreach center backup plan be now read with, without proper notice. Does the member have unanimous consent? Yes. 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 Okay. <clears throat> motion 63. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition moves, seconded by the member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas the government's recent decision to try to move the Community Outreach Centre appears to have been sudden, and whereas government has had more than four years to develop a coherent plan to help vulnerable people and protect communities, and whereas the government is now relying on the City of Charlottetown to accommodate its current plan by permitting the relocation of the Community Outreach Centre to another neighbourhood, and whereas the Premier publicly said on November 3, 2023, that government has no backup plan in the event the City opts to deny the a municipal permit. And whereas much of the outreach problem is related to obvious challenges in mental health, addictions and homelessness. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge the government to immediately release a backup plan to support vulnerable islanders 
in the event that relocation of the outreach center does not receive city approval. Therefore, be it further resolved that this backup plan include firm dates for the closure of the current outreach center. <coughs> and therefore, be it further resolved that the province's backup plan rely on community consultation and approval. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge the province to take direct control of the operations of a future center, staffed with the expertise required to meet the challenging needs of vulnerable islanders. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very, very much, Madam Speaker. Um, so this is uh, an opportunity for me to stand in the House, not only to ask questions earlier today about the Outreach Centre, but to speak about my perspective of it and the perspective of so many, uh, hundreds, even thousands of others who have uh, voiced their opinion on the location and the services and programs that are being currently provided at the Outreach Centre, uh, location, located on Euston Street presently. So this started as a pilot program a few years ago. How long does a pilot program go? We don't know. You know, nobody seems to know how, how long it goes before they they come out with what the what their um, their plan is uh, to deal with mental health and the mental health and addictions with uh, homelessness. Um, something needs to be, um, for lack of a better word, something needs to be done because these numbers are growing. It's increasing day after day. Um, I make it uh, my choice uh, when I come in here in the morning to drive by the centre um, to see what the residents are saying. Is it actually what they're saying um, is what I see and it does. It does confirm what they're saying. Um, there are individuals that really need uh, the supports that currently are not going to that centre because they're afraid of just a walk in the, through the, the parking lot to get to the centre, they're, they're going to be introduced uh, to either to buy or to use. And I know personally this has happened. It's happened as of last Friday with me, with an individual from my own district who went, who reached out, um, went to Mount Herbert, did the seven days, was released on the streets afterwards because couldn't get into the transitional units. Um, he was assessed to be too weak to go to Talbot House. Um, they called Hillsborough, didn't have a bed for him. They suggested he go to Bedford McDonald. He said, absolutely not. I know the people, the clientele that go there. I am trying to get to stay off um, the addictions and, and, and I do not need to be surrounded by people who are going to be, or the, in that environment, where people would be pressuring me into, into using. I also, um, tried that night to find housing for him. He, he ended up getting housing, but it was early hours of the morning before that happened. He was able to stay in um, a local business uh, for the day uh, until uh, we were able to resolve um, his, at that time, homelessness um, and found him some shelter. But he also did not want to go to that center because he, he, had, he had $300 in his pocket. He said, I am trying to get off um, addictions, um, yes, I made a choice years ago. Uh, it was a poor choice. Um, this gentleman in 2011, in 2012, um, had gotten into off-island programming um, for a few months, went on the meth program and he came back, weeded himself off that and was happy in the community that he lived in. Uh, he had a great quality of life compared to what he had during the years of his addictions. Then he had an accident at work in which he cut uh, a part of his finger off. He went to the doctor, guess what the doctor gave him? Anyway, so relapsed and then he's been ever since trying to control it, trying to get control of it. He finally hit rock bottom again last week, or the week before, sorry. So he's reaching out. The system is failing him. I've always said there needs to be consistency in this, in this, in this system. Um, when they get out of one program, they need to, it needs to be seamless that they move into another. Because if they go back into the environment they're in, they're going to continue to use, Madam Speaker. And they know that. The outreach center has open drug use in the parking lot that I can see, that others can see. This, that is not, not very uh, helpful to those individuals who seek support in the program that's offered at the Outreach Centre. People go there for direction 
And if they can't get in those doors without being challenged or being uh, introduced to uh, drug use, then that, that's a really serious issue, very serious issue. That's not even to mention what the residents of the area have to, have to put up with. I mean, the, at the end of the day, the decision to put the outreach center in the middle of a residential area in between two schools, a post-secondary institution just down the road, uh, and a very busy intersection of Charlottetown across from a gas and convenience store that's quite popular. It, it blows my mind as to why that decision was made. I've been asking why that decision was made for years and I'm still not getting a good response to it. Even today, during question period, when I asked the Premier about his plans to move the outreach centre um, to Park Street, um, and he, the only reason why why that decision was announced last Friday was was born out of, of panic. Um, it was not good planning. It was very reactive from the public outcry and also from, and I will say, from the opposition, uh, putting a little pressure on the government uh, to react to this uh, very serious issue. They have the government has continually um, mishandled um, the community outreach centre um, over the last four years, let's say. Um, so they, they have this way of creating um, division. They love to sit back right now and allow either the public um, to, to turn their anger uh, uh, towards uh, the organization that's running the outreach center, towards city police, and also towards the city of Charlottetown. When it's the government's responsibility Right from day one, it was the government's responsibility. Uh, they chose this location. They chose the objectives of this location. So they have to bear the responsibility of this and not watch or, or throw others underneath the bus. And that seems to be what they're doing today. So this motion calls on a backup plan. My questions today to the Premier were asking him about a backup plan. He stated on Friday that he did not have a backup plan. And what is he doing? He's putting this again back on the city of Charlottetown. They are the ones now that need to make a decision of whether they're going to grant a variance, a zoning variance, to where to have this uh, located. No consultation at all. No consultation with the uh, residents of that community. No consultation with anybody in the public. And obviously no consultation with the city of Charlottetown, Charlottetown Police, or any anyone else. Um, it's just, again, they fumble quite often, and they're reactive, and this government needs to make a decision, but they need to have a plan in place. And once they have this plan in place, then they need to do the consulting uh, on it. That is something we, we are calling for in the opposition office. Um, So the Premier publicly said on November the 3rd, last Friday, that government has no backup plan um, in the event the city opts to avoid the province's apparently inability to keep pace with rapidly changing demands in mental health, addictions, and homelessness. And Madam Speaker, we cannot, and I said it before, keep kicking this down the road, and that's exactly what's happening right now. Instead of dealing with the root of the problems, the government has just kicked it down the road, literally and figuratively, to a new neighborhood. Now the new proposed area, if it was to go through, has the homeless shelter in the same compound as people who are openly using drugs. It's all in one, and it has the makings of a bomb, Madam Speaker. They are not dealing with the, pro with the problems that exist right across Prince Edward Island, and this Premier needs to be more uh, proactive. Um, he needs to acknowledge that they mishandled this, that he needs to acknowledge the fact that, yes, you know what, we are going to put a plan in place and this is what we're going to do. They knocked on doors six months ago on this province asking Islanders to put faith in their platform, to put faith in them that they will resolve the issues that are currently being, in this instance, plagued. Um, by Islanders. They cannot 
put this on someone else. The Premier today asked, he said, oh, I'd love to see somebody else had some, some ideas, some decisions to make on this. They asked for this. They are in place to make the decisions. They have the resources available to make those decisions happen. They, the reluctance to do so just shows their non-compassion um, for the residents and for the most vulnerable sector we have on Prince Edward Island, Madam Speaker. And this has definitely, definitely let them down and created a more of a problem that we see right now um, at the Outreach Centre in Charlottetown. And I have been saying this uh, for, for years. In my area, we don't have a huge problem. We don't have a huge volume of people um, in my community. However, there are many families that are impacted by um, mental health and addictions who seek uh, programming here in Charlottetown. And I've said it before, I think it was at a standing committee, I have uh, people in my area, one in particular, who used to travel on the, the Tooney Transit uh, to come down to use the services that were provided at a reach centre. And, and some of those services were good. Premier said today, there are success stories. I'm not going to deny there's no success stories. But they're outnumbered by the unsuccessful stories that, that we hear on a day in and day out basis, Madam Speaker. And this government has let Islanders down. They've let the organization, organizations, because there's been a, a few um, at the Outreach Center down. They let the city of Charlottetown down. They've let the city police down. And something needs to change. First of all, it's the acknowledgement that they made poor decisions and they need to acknowledge that they have to work on a plan moving forward. Their backup plan right now is zero, nothing. They have, they have none. So if the city says, no, we're not going to grant this variance, what, what next? So will it stay at the same location for another four years? We don't know. There needs to be a plan put in place. That's what we're asking for. There's not one minister across the floor here that, that this issue does not, um, I guess, it, it affects every one of their departments in one way or the other. I can look at every one of you guys across the floor and know that it impacts not only your community, the honors, but it impacts the, some of the programming and decisions that are made within each and every one of your departments. And I look forward to each one of you standing up here today. And this is, I'm, not, I'm going to be very brief on this because I want to hear from, from, from those who are the, the decision makers in this, what you have to say. Um, in particular, I want to hear the uh, Housing, Lands and Communities Minister about uh, his part in this, his take on this. Uh, you know, he mentioned in his comments on Friday that he drove around looking for um, suitable locations. Well, what was that criteria? What were some other options uh, of buildings or locations that were available? Did he go to the entire city of Charlottetown? Did he go to, you know, uh, uptown, downtown? Did he go to Brighton? and drive around and look for a location. These are things that he has to, um, to answer to. These questions I'm asking, these questions the Islanders are asking. We want to know what you're doing. Consultation said there was zero, and that was again confirmed at the um, announcement when the consultation was going to happen that afternoon after the announcement was made, Madam Speaker. So that's not how I would consult with a community or a neighborhood. Um, when the uh, center that the model that's the center that's currently not working is placed in their own backyards without any, any changes to it. So, Madam Speaker, I'm going to close with that. Um, again, I want to encourage all members of this house to please stand up. Tell us what your plans are to moving this forward. Tell us what you've been advocating for, because we're not the only ones in opposition that are hearing these cries for help and support, and how this is not working. I know each and every one of you guys have heard multiple times on this topic. So this is your opportunity to um, tell us what you guys are doing, to tell Islanders what you guys are doing, to try to alleviate some of the pressures that are put on not only the Islanders and residents in the area, but to support the families and the individuals that need um, their support through mental health and addictions. Thank you. <clears throat> Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it's um, 
interesting to rise again and talk about this topic, which I've talked about numerous times over the last four <coughs> years, numerous times to deaf ears, numerous times to a government that doesn't listen. Four ministers, five different locations, two different service, three different service providers, and more. And here we are. And it's not fair to the people that are trying to help you out. It's not fair to the people trying to support you. <coughs> when you don't communicate and you have no plan, it's apparent. <coughs> Just last year, I was in a meeting and um, uh, officials from the Department of Health said that they will <coughs> not go into the outreach center to provide <coughs> services. <coughs> Think about that. There's groups trying to help solve the problem and you won't send staff in. That's where the problems are. That's true, Minister. It's true. Because your own Associate Deputy Minister said it was. Yep. Here we are in the situation. This started way back. This started a long time ago with the government trying to do a few of the right things, but failing in execution, trying to... Yeah, and, and, and you know what? The minister, the, the person clapping, I'm going to talk about too, because he sat there on the floor of the legislature, and I asked him, I asked him, before I knew, I asked him, did you buy a curling club? What are you doing with a curling club? Why would you buy a curling club? What are you going to do with it, Minister? Wouldn't answer the question. Wouldn't answer the question. Are you moving the outreach center there? And the most important question I asked, the most important question I asked, we, will you, before you do anything, consult with the public? And I didn't get an answer. There was no consultation and movements all over the city. So when, when we're hearing too, the Premier stand up and say, what do you all, what do you all have to do? What are you gonna do to help this? I, I mean, it's, what, that's such an odd question at this point, four years later. When we, when, we, when we have different reports from standing committees on the topic of the Outreach Center. This was last year in September. Your committee recommends that government organize an independent review of services provided at the Outreach Center. Number two, your committee recommends that government foster ongoing public consultation and engagement with the Community Outreach Center. Your committee recommends that government develop and publish terms of reference for the Community Outreach Center working group that clearly outlines its mandate, purpose, roles, responsibilities, and reporting structure. And then we hear the government's chairing that. I mean, how are people supposed to get, come back to you? How are we supposed to have any trust when you don't allow the service providers to have any success? They came in, the adventure group came in after the Salvation Army group, after the Salvation Army took it over and they said, you know what, we can't do this anymore. We've tried, we can't do this anymore. They're still in the continuum and they, they're still playing a, a big role. But then they came in to help you out and you didn't support them. And don't say you did, because I know how this went. We're at a position where we're asking our people, we're asking our people in, in, in this community to, to do things and support when you weren't there, when government wasn't there. We have no data. We have no data. I've asked for it constantly, Minister. I've asked for it from four different ministers, nothing. We've asked it for it, and, the, and they said, hey, you know what, this is running as a pilot program. This is running as a pilot program. If anybody on that side of the house can, knows what a pilot program is, it usually has a start and an end and evaluation and criteria, and you outline the scope of what you're doing and how you're going to get there and with who. None of that. Because I don't even think it ever ended. When asked uh, housing officials in there, um, uh, what, what, was the, what, what happened with the, the, the pilot program? You know what the answer was? Well, we know that we need it. Of course we know that we need it. But we have to get the services and we have to get this right. And you didn't do it. I asked the minister across the way, a former minister, minister number two, because there's four, minister number two. Okay. I asked him a series of, of questions in there that's very, very important to say, hey, you know what? What are you doing to support the NGOs? What are you doing to make this happen? No answers. What are we doing? I asked about... Um, why you put a location in between two schools. And you got to remember before that, we didn't even, know, I don't even know, all of a sudden a fence starts popping up, then they can't, they can't build it, then it has to go back up, and then they put a, a, a dumpster by the front corner and there's bicycles all over the place. You had no control over this. And the community still stayed with you. 
The community still stayed with you. I ask, what in the world is a $3 million investment in a capital budget this time last year? What are you investing $3 million in the curling club or the former curling club? What is that money going to crickets? You don't know. You know what it should have been gone for if, if you were going to keep it up? A wheelchair accessibility center, somewhere that people that have to travel from the Charlottetown Library and wheel themselves in snowstorms to Park Street can use. Do you know what happens? Do you know what happens when you are not in one of the locations to use the shelter line, which a member asked questions about, but he, he maybe um, got confused in there. When you call a sh the shelter line from a library, you cannot get support. It's only in certain locations that you can get support. So not a word of a lie. A member, a 75-year-old and the Minister of Social Development and Seniors, a min uh, I'm talking to you and everybody else in cabinet over there, had to wheel himself in the snowstorm a, a week ago with a buddy of his 2.7 kilometers from the Charlottetown Library to Park Street. You want to know it's broken? It's not just that. It's a whole reset of the whole entire thing and how you're delivering the continuum of this and how we're going to do it. And maybe now you'll start to listen because you haven't before. So if you come to us and ask what we're going to do, yeah, I know what I'm going to do because I'm, I'm there. I was at the shelter that night. I was there to meet him. I wanted to know what it felt like to be standing in line at Bedford McDonald House. This is a major problem. We need a plan for the whole thing. And if you want something to go to the bank with, you can start by opening up shelters 24 hours a day. It's that simple. It's that simple. You need to decentralize what's happening here. You need to use your community partners because they want to help you, or they at least did want to help you. Mm -hmm. I don't know about now. You need to bring case management into the provincial government under one roof so that we know what's going on. You need to use the third floor at Smith Lodge. It has six beds and I just toured not five days ago. It's not being used. Crumpled up paper, newspapers. So don't come at me and tell me that this is, we've got 18 beds open. You're not using six. You're not using the accessibility beds at Bedford McDonald House. You're not supporting any of this. So you want, to, you want to start with this? I know what's going on. Because I care, and I know you care too. But you got to see what's happening. You got to open up your eyes. You got to start listening with your eyes and ears or whatever you want to do and make sure you understand the seriousness of this because it's getting worse. The people in line at Bedford McDonald House, the gentleman I was talking to, his aunt sold his house. The, not his house, his aunt sold a house. He's in line at Bedford McDonald House. For the last two weeks, he's been sleeping in his car. He wasn't complaining. He was just answering my questions. He doesn't have any place to go. He says he, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to go up there. He'll stay in his car. He doesn't want to use the services you provide. You cannot have somebody waiting in line for 20 minutes outside of a shelter in our province. We can do better than that, and we've told you that before. This is just one thing on the continuum. And now you're talking about, you're talking about on a Friday afternoon before the legislature opened, you come up with one of, a plan that is so conditional on other things. It's not a plan. It's to get you out of trouble. It's to get you out of this moment in time. That's not a plan. Okay, we know that has to, you have no backup plan, and that's why we're asking for this. You have to be ready. You are the government. When are you going to start governing? That will define you as how you deal with problems that are difficult. Preparation destroys excuses, and all you've done is give us excuses over here. I'm saying prepare. And you know what? Hopefully it might not be too late. Because when we're talking about building fences for kids, and we're talking about having to make sure that the area is safe, that's on, that's on you. Haven't done your job. Home and school, we're, we're hearing about it. You know, it might be a wake-up call, but it might not. You have a lot of work to do, both, both for the clients, for the people around, 
because the one thing on, as we went around uh, with our standing committee around the province, which was an incredible eye-open experience, communities want to help. They, they want to help in some way. They want to be there for you. And the one thing that I'll remember was, you know, the person who spoke and, and was in the standing committee, was in the standing committee two years before. And then we have a, why, why do I get upset? The premier sat here and said, this has just been sprung on us. This is just new within the last whatever. She spoke and go back and looking to look at her six recommendations because they're all valid right now. And she spoke again in Charlottetown at Blanchard. And you know what she said? I have a daughter that's grown up. I have a daughter that's grown up uh, amongst this. I'm worried about the winter because there's needles in snowbanks. Think about that. That's what, that's what parents in our community have to think about. You know, I, I, I understand the balance and I, and I get emotional because I, I definitely ask these questions and I will continue to ask these questions and I know they're difficult and I know we're in this situation but it just didn't spring up overnight. Mm -hmm. you, there's no contracts, there's no contract signed, there's, there's talk about I mean, the Minister of Health talked to another member and they said they talked this morning and then obviously you didn't because it just blew up in the legislature about a shelter line. The shelter line is important. I heard the same thing about another location today. I heard the same location, that the shelter line, and what's happening in my mind on this side of the house is that you, you, you said the legislature's opening up, we got to do something right now, shelter line, boom. Now you're sending five or six people here, four or five people there, and they call us. That we know. It's not a plan. It's not a plan. You got to make sure you work with your communities. You got to make sure you work with the people around you. And I mean, it, it's emotional because this is serving, you know, the people are scared. The people are scared of what's happening and they want to be a part of the solution. They definitely do. But if you don't come up with a backup plan, if you don't come up with something that's a little bit better, this, this problem is not, it's, it's going to be here six months. We're talking about the minimum of six months before anything happens. It's just, that's just the way it is if everything goes smoothly. You can do better, Minister, and you know what? This is so disjointed, and I can go through public safety, I can go through social development. Why is social development have nothing in their mandate letter on this? Makes no sense. Why is housing and social development split up? Makes no sense. Minister of Health, they wouldn't go there and don't tell me that they did because there was a large portion of time, go back through the history and, and tell me that they weren't because it's not there. This affects the members in Stratford whose kids go to Birchwood. It affects so many different people. Six MLAs in Stratford. I mean six MLAs in Charlottetown, two in Stratford. They all go there, I'm hearing about it, I know. So I'm looking forward to hearing every, everybody else speak and it's, it's emotional because I mean, I've tried to balance this very much in the past to get this right and I've tried to ask the questions that would push the government. I don't know what to do right now. I don't know what to do. And I mean, I have, a, I have some plans, but I want you to come up with a plan. You have the resources to do it. You understand the file and I'll continue to push you every step of the way. So I'll, I'll pass the floor and I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the official, or the third party, sorry. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I won't take much time. I too am entrusted to hear from, from other members. Um, I don't think there's been an issue in my whole entire life, counting my former career, where I've spent more time. It is a very emotional topic because of both what people are living for through in in my district and for those accessing shelter services. And let me be very clear, these are important, crucial services. The problem is we've centralized the heck out of them. When the member asked questions about um, busing people to different communities, we do that. We hide it, but we do that. If someone in Tignish needs a place to stay, from Summerside, we bus them to Charlottetown. Or we, sorry, we taxi them to Charlottetown, not even as cheap as a bus. We taxi them to Charlottetown. If we think about how much money we waste 
taking people to Charlottetown, taking them away from their support systems, taking them away from the only community they have, forcing them into unsafe, very vulnerable positions, and having to force them to form a new community here. A broken record right here, those two reports that I mentioned reference all the time, which I will table again now that it's a new sitting, um, about the community needs assessment in Eastern PEI, as well as the community needs assessment done for the Department of Social Development and Housing. Both of them were very clear. 24-7 emergency shelter services and services offered in people's communities. But you went against that, and look what's happened. Look, well, look what's happened. That's why this matters. I don't understand how government doesn't get this. These services should be offered where people need them. So we're doing all of this. All of this is happening. I have yet to hear anything about perhaps a new date for the mental health hospital, an addition of some beds at Mount Herbert. Why aren't we looking at the services we do have and trying to support them so that we can get people the help that they need? Because, you know, what we have happening at the Community Outreach Centre, and I know there's great things happening because I visit the Community Outreach Centre on a fairly regular basis. So I know about the things that are happening there, and there are some great success stories. And unfortunately, they are outweighed by what people are living through in the community, which tells me very clearly, A, there's not enough of these services, and B, why the heck are we not evaluating them so we can see how we can make them better? There's been no talk about that. We just keep bouncing it around, thinking, oh, you know, maybe if we move it here, it'll be better. Do you know what the definition of insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And now I know government will say, oh, but we've got four points here. You know, funding to support enhanced policing resources with the Charlottetown Police Service. A resident support team to work with homeowners in adjacent nearby properties. Multiple cleanup crews to ensure garbage, debris, and paraphernalia are cleaned up in public spaces. And appropriate procedures and process to work with clients who don't follow the accountability measures and respect for neighbors, community, and staff. Guess when these were mentioned at the first time? Under two or three ministers ago, where we had a community meeting. We had members of, we had the mayor there, there were members from the Charlottetown City Council, uh, there was the MLA for Charlottetown West Royalty was there, there were people from mental health and addictions, there were people from the department. It was a large meeting. And those things were all mentioned. And guess what? Oh yes, no, we will definitely do that. Of course we will do that. But you didn't. And now this is your, this is your answer. Why, why are you not listening to people? That is the biggest mistake that your government has made. Not only do you not listen, you don't ask because you don't care about that. It's a place that you want to go and the minister is looking at me and I appreciate it. I'm going to take a moment to say I really appreciated your comments this morning in response to questions. Because that was the first time I got a really strong indication, not the first time, we've had a couple of conversations, but it's the first time that I got the feeling that we understood the clientele. But when I reverse, and I think about, I'm, I had notes here, but I'm all over the place, that's okay. When I reverse it, and I look at the services we are offering, these are cookie cutters. We've got the emergency shelter, we've got the community outreach center and the overdose prevention site, which government's big plan is to put them all in the same place, which tells me that you do not understand the complexity of this. You're saying that everyone who's experiencing homelessness has the same needs. But you're not taking into account is that there's a whole bunch of different people in that spectrum, a whole bunch of people with different lived experiences, a whole bunch of people with different current life experiences. Do you think for one second, that if I needed housing support and I didn't feel safe going into the community outreach center, I'm going to go? I spoke to a woman who I do breakfast program with um, occasionally, and she was telling me that she, was, she used drugs heavily, she was heavily addicted on the streets of Calgary. And she said what helped her, the only thing that helped her was when she went into their community outreach center, which was different from ours in that not all the services were offered under one roof, because that is another huge issue. Um, but they could go in and, you know, she said, if I, I went in, I told them I wanted treatment right now, and I was whisked off to treatment, and I got treatment immediately. <laughs> we were sitting here listening in a, in a committee meeting the other day when the department said, oh, no, but when we call people back, they don't want help, so they don't want help. No, it's because they need help when they need it. 
Not when you think, when, when it's convenient for you or when there's a bed or whatever. They need it when they ask, but they don't get that most of the time. And that shows another lack of complete understanding. Um, when we had the, the community meeting at the Confederation Center of the Arts, a couple of things got slipped that evening. And one of the things was that a, a promise from government that there would be, because what, what that meeting was about was, um, was talking about an overdose prevention site and they were talking about the, um, sending the variants to the city of Charlottetown so that the city council could vote on whether it would go there or not. So it was just hearing community's concerns. And government assured everyone in that room that they would not send this variance off to the city of Charlottetown until this was all gone through with a fine tooth comb and that everything was taken into account. But the variance was sent before the meeting even started. Oh. Explain that, please. And I know it's true because I heard it from the horse's mouth. I don't see a government that feels the urgency here. I don't see a government who is willing to engage with the community to come up with real life solutions. Um, and as I mentioned about not centralizing the services, the, the Premier said this morning, you know, we need solutions. Well, that is the solution. You've already got them. 24-7 emergency shelter services and services offered in people's community. There's a suggestion. Let's start there because we've centralized the heck out of it. We've seen what it does to communities. And I will tell you, I am in support of all of these services because they are needed. But let me share with you my own personal um, experience with living here. When we say, when we talk about harm reduction, which is absolutely necessary, we should have known right away that that would mean there are going to be needles. There are going to be um, clothes, there's going to be de more debris than usual. Of course there is. We should have had cleanup teams on it right away. So my son finds needles on a regular basis. Often when I get home from work, I'm walking over to the park with my phone to find out where they are so that I can call in to public works and get them to pick up the needles. This is, that's very normal in our household. My son, when he first started to find them, who literally, when he gets home from school, he walks in the house, he throws a soccer ball, or sorry, he throws a school bag, not a soccer ball, grabs a soccer ball and goes to the park. And the other day he came in, this was a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, he came in and he threw a soccer ball and he laid on the couch with big tears in his eyes and he said, I just can't play outside anymore, Mom, it's too discouraging. Um, the other day, I'm, so this was maybe a, a, three weeks ago, I'm sitting in my backyard, relaxing, enjoying a nice sunny, I think I don't remember what kind of evening it was, Saturday maybe, and he comes and he starts telling me this story and of course I put, I'm tired, I'm only half listening, but then I started he hear him, hearing him say, um, and he resisted arrest, Mom, and the police officer jumped on his back, and I said, what? When did the, wh what, where? And he said, at the park. I said, when? He said, just now. We need to evaluate the services we have. There's not enough of them. There's not treatment when people want it. There's not services when people need it. We, let, so let's talk about the very fact at the very beginning when we started talking about this, and then I'm going to stop talking, although I have so much, I could talk about this for days. In the very beginning when we talked about offering this service, I said, a bunch of us said, you need to ensure that while you're building services like this, at the same time you're building house housing, supportive housing, transitional housing, not just emergency shelter. Of course that's part of the continuum. We need it, but it's not the only thing that we need. We talked about 24-7 emergency shelter services. We talked about offering services in people's communities, although we seem to have moved completely away from that idea. We have, so we have done very little for housing, health care. People can't access treatment when they need it. This is not, this community outreach center is not and never was the magical answer. It was part of a continuum of services, but right now it is the only service we're offering for people who are in crisis. And I urge you to come up. We don't even have an environmental assessment done. We don't know how much it's going to cost if we want to build anything permanent on this land. Um, we have no idea. So how much money are we wasting on these temporary solutions? It is insane to me what we're willing to spend on that. Engage with the community. 
engage with the clients accessing the services, see what it is that they need, and then offer it. Because I guarantee you're not going to hear from anyone that what we've got right now is working. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm sort of surprised I'm next up. I waited uh, for a fairly lengthy period, hoping that I would give space for somebody, anybody on the government side, to be willing to speak to this. There have been invitations from all prior speakers on this side of the House. And um, so I'm surprised I'm, I'm next up, Madam Speaker, but I, I, uh, I'm ready to go. And, and, and this is, let's be clear, this is an awful situation. It's a terrible situation. And the status quo is not working for anybody. It's not working for those vulnerable people who are living with overwhelmingly challenging mental health and addiction problems. And it is certainly not working for the folks who live in the vicinity of the community outreach center. And it strikes as an issue I have been absorbed by as, as the leader of the third party for a very long time now. And it's absolutely clear to us that things are deteriorating at a fairly rapid pace. I want to say right off the top, Madam Speaker, that there's nowhere that has navigated um, this treacherous, treacherous, sad, painful, um, divisive territory that is prevalent street drug use in, in their community well. Nobody has done it well. It's an incredibly complex and, to a certain extent, intractable problem. It stems from all kinds of foundational issues that, that go beyond what a community outreach centre by itself can fix. Nobody has done this well. And there are no quick, satisfactory, immediate results, the, the remedies, excuse me. However, there are better ways of managing it, better and worse ways of managing it. And I have to say, categorically, that in Prince Edward Island's case, it has been managed appallingly. I, I, don't, I choose that word carefully. It has been appalling what we have done to try and tackle this universal problem. I also want to say, and, uh, and I stand in support of this motion, let me be clear on that before I say this, but the motion calls on government to release a community outreach centre backup plan. Now, the concern I have or the issue I have with the title of the motion is that the community outreach centre does not exist in isolation. Uh, it, if it were to work well, it has to be part of an integrated, interdependent suite of supports. 24-hour shelters, absolutely critical. An overdose prevention site and a properly resourced and properly managed community outreach centre. If we focus on the failures of the community outreach centre without recognising that its success is dependent on these other elements, then we will, all we will do is move this to an, an assured failure in a different location. We've already done that three times. Let's not do that again. So we don't, in my mind, actually need a community outreach centre backup plan because we'll fail again. We need a properly conceived, evidence-based, properly located suite of services. And only then will we provide the help that those with mental health and addiction challenges absolutely require, and the leader of the third party said it well, these services are absolutely required in our community. And the thought of shutting the community outreach centre down cold without proper planning to make sure that those people who need the services that are there uh, is unthinkable. But we haven't had that. We haven't had thoughtful, properly conceived, evidence-based 
services from this government. It's been appalling. What we have had is years of mismanagement, of, uh, of dithering, and I would say, quite blatantly, of crass political manipulation. Those are strong words. But I think back to the election, and I think back to an announcement mid-election, which was not helpful to the situation, not helpful to the community, not helpful to those who are suffering with mental health challenges. The only reason that announcement was made, and I offer this as my personal opinion, was for political gain. It was helpful to the candidate of a particular political stripe. That is a dreadful, dreadful way to play with people's lives. And I was absolutely astounded when that announcement came forward in the middle of, a, of the election. There are clear evidence-based answers available to us, and we could employ them to some of them literally tomorrow if we had the political will to do that. We need comprehensive, co coordinated services that, that, will, that will work together to make sure that the folks who are affected by this, and, and this is not an either or issue. We have to be absolutely clear about that. We don't have to choose, neither should we choose, between the well-being of, of vulnerable people in our community and the well-being of those who live in the vicinity of uh, the community outreach center. It's not an either or issue. A thoughtful, well-managed government can provide hope and relief to both communities. And they have to do that. And we have not seen that from this government. Oh my gosh. There's so much more I could say. I'm looking at the time and I'm hoping, Madam Speaker, that there are others on the list from the government side who are willing to speak to this crucial issue, which has caused such schisms in the community, and which requires a government of courage, a government of vision, a government able to make the difficult decisions to come forward and do that, not simply move things around and hope that they're going to fix themselves, because they are not going to fix themselves. People have real valid concerns in the community about their safety. They're fearful for their safety. People with mental health and addictions challenges have real valid issues that this government is responsible to deal with, health issues that this government must provide the services for. And in both cases, for both communities, we are failing. We want to create one community where people can live together peacefully, without fear, with a sense of, of respect for everybody. And it's this government's responsibility to create that atmosphere, and they have, done, they have not done that indeed. They have created fear and division where we needed unity and respect. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to close my remarks there, and I really hope that we hear from the many ministers who are part of the potential solution to this awful situation who will speak to this motion. Thank you, Madam. Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Where to start? I want to start by um, addressing this uh, notion that this, uh, the decision or the announcement we made last week was sudden. Um, I've said publicly many times in the media and publicly that Park Street has always been a top consideration for moving the outreach services. We've been in somewhat of a holding pattern at a very unfortunate time when things are escalating badly at the Houston Street location. But as I've, as I've said in media interviews, we are awaiting the results of an environmental assessment at, at Park Street. Those results, a draft version of that report, some of the work is still ongoing, but a draft version of the report we do have now. 
that the work will continue to go on, but we have enough information in that draft report, which we received, I don't call exactly, a couple of weeks ago maybe. There's enough information in that report now that enabled us to make decisions about what could actually go to Park Street. Now, obviously that site has been used for industrial purposes for decades, and we knew that it would show problems with contamination. And it was only responsible, it's necessary, it's obligatory for us to understand the environmental condition of the property and what can be done with it. If you look across the street, if you look across the street at the Charlottetown events grounds, you notice it was turned into an events ground because you couldn't do anything else with it. It was a former tank farm and it's completely contaminated and they've capped it off with soil and called it an events ground. But really not much else can be done there. So we have enough information now to say, you know, the, we understand that Houston Street is not the location for these services. It doesn't work for anybody. It doesn't work, the location doesn't work for anybody that uses the services. The location doesn't work for anybody who delivers the services. It doesn't work for the people in the surrounding community. Why did we buy it? Well, I wasn't part of that decision-making process, but I can tell you that the situation at that time was much different than it is now. I remember when this, you know, we can look at the, you can look at the news, the front page of any newspaper, if they exist, or their websites, across the world, across the country, across this region, and you'll see the same situation playing out. I've discussed it with my colleagues across the country who are dealing with it. And I'm losing my train of thought here a little bit, but um, it is everywhere. And, oh, I, I, and I can remember the days when we realized that something was happening. I can remember the days, you know, not that long ago. It seems like a lifetime ago, but not that long ago, where you'd walk down Queen Street in, in downtown Charlottetown and wonder, where did this guy come from? I've seen him here a few days, sitting on a stoop, asking for donations. Who are these people? Where'd they come from? And then people begin to ask, well, what are we going to do with them? They, they, they apparently need help. And the situation has continued to escalate. Exacerbated by COVID. <clears throat> Cracked open society in ways that we never imagined it could. Cheap practically free drugs in some circumstances dumped into our communities to get people hooked. The Minister of Health just showed me the most shocking graph I've seen in a long time about the effects uh, on public health when fentanyl enter enters a community. So how do we get here? Very quickly, in the grand scheme of things, very, very quickly. And we've tried to respond at every step of the way as appropriately as we could possibly come up with at the time. And yes, it's gotten worse and we can do better. I've acknowledged that. We can do much better. I have great sympathy for the people of Charlottetown and particularly those in proximity to the Outreach Center who had suffered a lot of misery. I have great sympathy for the, the people, the clients of the Outreach Center who are not getting the optimal service that they, that they deserve. I have great sympathy for the people who operate the Outreach Center who have put, been put in a very difficult position. And I take exception, and I got a wink from the operator of that Outreach Center when you said we haven't supported them because I have been there to support them. I have been in that outreach center on a regular basis, I have the floor. I have the floor. I've been in that outreach center on a regular basis. We've supported them every step of the way when we could. I don't just drive by, I drive in. You know, and part of what's wrong, part of the problem, it's not the entire problem. You know, the first time I visited, the, the, the first time I, the first, 
the first time I visited that place, I said, I need to bring my kids here. Because if you don't visit that place, meet the people who are served there and meet the people who are delivering the services, you don't have a full understanding of what's happening. And, you know, so what's happening outside that facility has very much overshadowed what's happening inside. That's unfortunate, and it is partly because it's a bad location. You've got a large front parking lot where people can come in, hang out, without even checking into the center. It creates a very poor public perception, but it's also not the way it should be operating. We know that. We know that. So we've not acted suddenly. The timing, I'll admit, looks suspicious. But it's just the way things have unfolded. We're in a position to make a decision. We're in a position that we've been able to acquire help, expertise help, who will advise us, lead a task force, and help us move forward with her expertise, her experience, that we can apply here to put us on a better path forward, a stable path forward. So, also, what's being, there's too much focus on the fact that we're moving these, or asking to move these services to Park Street. The larger focus should be that we are hitting the reset button, we've brought on more resources, we're going to focus on, create a, on a renewed model of service. Nobody should assume that anything will look the same going forward. Do not make that assumption because everything is on the table. So, the um, accusation has been made that somehow we're putting the city in a difficult situation, offloading this decision to them. Let me address that. In every jurisdiction in Canada, municipalities typically have some responsibility for delivering services to this community, for homelessness, for vulnerable people. For some reason, I'm not sure why, but that's not the situation here in this province. And that's fine. We've accepted that responsibility. We're moving forward. But the city of, the city of Charlottetown has a responsibility to deal with land use. Now, I just said this in a media interview downstairs. You probably see it on the news today. They have a responsibility to make those decisions. The municipality is a creature of, your municipal, of, uh, of the province by legislation. We can probably find a way to go around them. How would that go over on this side? How would that go over with the, uh, with the community? We're working collaboratively with the city. They understand they have a role to play. We're trying to provide them with as much information as we possibly can. We've met with them numerous times last week, the mayor, the deputy mayor, the CAO, the director of corporate services. We've, we've agreed on some basic principles to move forward without bumping heads. We all have a collective responsibility to deal with this. And we're doing that. So anyone that makes accusations of, oh, this, the province is dumping this problem on us, making us make the decision about it, well, yes, you do have a responsibility, some responsibility for this social issue that exists in our city. You just need to make a simple decision about land use planning. So I have great the hour has been called. <clears throat> Do we have support to extend the hour? I move to close the debate. Seconded by uh, the Minister of Social Development Seniors. I will remember from Kensington Malpeck. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by Board and Kinkora that this House adjourn until November 8th at 1 p.m. Shall carry. Very, very. Well, good evening, everyone.